Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'd like to call to order the June 21st, 2021 Delray Beach Planning and Zoning Board. It is 6.02 p.m. by my clock. Um, Diane, would you please call the roll? Joy Howell. Absent. Alan Zeller. Here. Dylan Blankenship. Here. Max Weinberg. Absent. Christina Morrison. Here. Chris Day. Here. That being out of the way, um, I would like, uh, has everybody had an opportunity to review the agenda? Are there any changes to the agenda this evening? There are no Amy? changes to the agenda. Wonderful, Amy. Can I get a motion to approve the agenda in a second? Motion to approve. Second. I, all in favor? Aye. 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 That motion passed unanimously. And we can now move on to item number four, which would be the approval of the minutes that were included with our agenda. And that was the approval. We'll first look at the April 19th, 2021 minutes. Has everybody present had an opportunity to review them? Motion to approve. There we go. Second, please. All right, second. And can you please call the roll? Zeller? Yes. Blankenship? Yes. Christina Morrison? Yes. Chris Yes. And has everybody had the opportunity to review the May 17th, 2021? Yeah, I think there's one change, Mr. Chair. Oh. oh. I think Max is here. Excuse me one moment. We're going to take <laughs> a break while um, some members that were late are joining us. Let the record show that Joy Howell and Max Weinberg uh, entered the meeting at 6.04 p.m. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Chair. No problem. <laughs> Sorry, Christina, you, you were interrupted. Change to the May 17th minutes under uh, board comments for number 7A. I believe the second Chris Davey con comment should be Christina Morrison comment. From change the gold to silver. The rest, look, the rest of the minutes look fine. So I'd like to make a motion to approve as amended. Do I have a second? I'm not sure I recall that it was changed from gold to silver. It wasn't. It was just my recommendation. It was Christina's recommendation at that meeting. That was the last meeting. It was under the motion portion of these minutes, not the amended motion. It already is silver. Diane, can you go back and just check that, please? Yes. If you don't mind. And that way, there'll be no doubt. Okay. I don't have a second. Um, and assuming, uh, Christine, I don't know if you would Do you want me to entertain withhold? amending your motion that when Diane reviews it, we can consider it approved. So moved. Mm -hmm. Is that okay with you? Mm -hmm. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Ms. Blankenship. Diane, can you please call the roll? Joy Howell? Aye. Alan Seller? Yes. With that condition, yes. Joy Blankenship? Yes. Max Weinberg? Yes. Christina Morrison? Yes. Christine? Yes. Okay, um, Diane, could I ask you to please swear in any of the members of the public that wish to speak this evening? And staff. Hand on the authority vested in me the notary of the state of Florida. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you, Diane. At this time, I'm going to read the quasi judicial hearing rules for the city of Delray Beach. We have several items that are on the agenda this evening that are quasi judicial items. 
This hearing shall be conducted in accordance with the City of Delray Beach quasi-judicial rules. The applicant and the city shall be permitted to present their case. The public shall be allowed to speak for three minutes each or a maximum of six minutes if the person represents an organization or a group of people who are present but agree not to speak. The city commission, in our case, the board members, and the applicant may be allowed to cross-examine a witness. The city or the applicant will be allowed to offer rebuttal testimony. The decision to approve or deny an application or appeal may not legally be made upon personal views as to whether a project is a good project or not, nor may a decision be based upon the number of citizens who support or oppose a particular project. The law requires that all decisions must be made on the basis of whether the project meets the requirements of law, the Delray Beach Comprehensive Plan, and the Delray Beach Land Development Regulations. With that, I see there are a number of members of the public present this evening. Thank you very much for coming. And I would like to ask at this time if anybody has public comment on an item that is not on the agenda, this is where you may come up and speak for three minutes. Is there anybody here who's wishing to speak on an item that's not on the agenda? That would be me. Ms. Clark. Anyone else before me? Okay. Ms. Clark, please state your name and I address will. for the record. <laughs> Gail Clark, 124 Northeast um, 7th Avenue came to talk about my favorite subject, trees. Um, I, I'm kind of just here to find out if, if what's going on, if we have a tree ordinance at all. I know starting back as far as, well, probably further than this, 2018, we were talking about a banyan tree in the Palm Trail neighborhood on the 7th Avenue. Um, it's on the corner, it's been there uh, I know somebody who's 75 years old that used to swing on it when they were a child. So it's about 100 years old. And it's an amazing tree. There are a lot of these kind of legacy tri champion trees in our town. And it was sold. We fought and fought. Uh, evidently, the sale didn't go through. But now the guy who's built the, building the pr house next to it has kind of just shaved half of it off, I'm sure, in an effort to, you know, blight it or kill it or something like that so that that tree will go. And I've lived in my neighborhood since... For three, you know, for tw almost 20 years. And I know 13 large trees have gone just in 7th Avenue, 1st Court, either through the hurricane or just being taken down because of, and the neighborhood's hotter. You hear more noise from, there's no habitats. You hear more noise from the street. It's a warming thing. Water stands on my street now, Northeast 7th Avenue, that didn't stand there. It floods all the time because roots were absorbing water. I mean, this is what's happening all over the, the town. We talked about a tree ordinance. Price Patton, who's now the president of the trust, talked about the banyan tree, talked about um, things specific to that since then, uh, the, the horrible debacle that happened over on the Sunday property. Originally, there were 300 trees. This is, goes back, I think, three years. Uh, the conclusion came to where 140 were going, 150 were staying, I believe. And all of this is documented. Um, well, they just recently went over there and through some glitch in the city or something, they're all gone. And I'm not talking, the rare trees, baboa, leeches, live oaks, trees, magnolias, um, I mean, uh, mahoganies, trees that had been there for many, many years. And they're gone. Nobody got to vote on it. We didn't get to do anything about it. it there was going to be a tree overlay on Swinton that was discussed um, years ago. Three, three to five years ago, same thing, a tree moratorium in Palm Trail. I kind of want to know where everything stands because Claudia Willis, who's been here for many, many years, has made a suggestion that until we maybe follow the example of Key West, that have a moratorium on, on destroying any trees on properties. It's property next to her, and she's in the marina district, right on the marina, marine way. The house next to her was taken down, but there was a site plan and had trees remaining on it. One day, the people that are building the, pro the house went over there, and the trees were in the way, so he just did a sweeping gesture there. It was clear-cut. There's been a clear-cut property now over in the, um, by Carolyn, in the, um, 
on the other side of the island, on the, on the barrier island. I mean, people are just clear-cutting everything. And I'd like to propose a moratorium on, on cutting trees on properties until we decide to specify protected trees to do something to try to, to stop this. You don't go up and down the east, eastern seaboard coast anywhere in the United States and people will cut your toe off before they'll let you cut down their legacy trees that have been there for years and years. You go on the grass, but not in Delray Beach. They're, what, trees are getting whacked, developers buy property, they know the tree is there and they don't care. Or they tear it down and because they can put money into a tree fund, that's okay. okay. It's still worth it to them for to cut these trees down. I'd like to know where we stand if we don't have a, um, a tree committee or a tree group to try to figure out what could be legacy trees or protected trees or just put a halt on everything so that people think twice about buying a piece of property that has a tree on it or Palm Trail, excuse me, Palm Square. It had a nice treescape right there behind the Blue Anchor, a property owned by uh, Mr. Handelsman that's been there for years. He's leasing it and his tenants went in and clear cut the two trees I used to live there that are probably 70 years old and there's two stick palms there. And as I understand it, I talked to Ms. Hoyland, she said there's really nothing to protect somebody if an owner buys something to keep you from tearing down what's there, everything. Yep. So I'm just kind of not knowing exactly where we're at. I've talked to several of you about this. If we could figure something out, I know a few of you really are concerned about this and you know, gone is One. gone. Gone is like dead. Ms. Clark, it's done. why don't we do this? Um, I'm not exactly sure what our tree ordinance is at the moment, and I would not want to give you misinformation. Sure. So what I'd ask is that um, you please leave your phone number, your e email address with Diane, the board secretary. Sure. And we would just ask that, uh, William, either somebody from the city attorney's office or somebody from the planning and zoning department get back and speak to you and give you what's, what the LDRs are concerning trees and uh, our commission decides what things get passed and we actually have an item on the agenda this evening about amendments to our LDRs or code and it would have to be sponsored in the future. So I know you know our city commissioners. I would suggest find out exactly what the rules are and uh, put your head together with some of your friends and definitely uh, propose something to the commission that would be an improvement. Okay. okay, well, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank Have a good evening. Thank you. Is there anybody else from the city, look, anybody else who's present looking to speak on an item that is not on the agenda? I do not see any, so we can move on to item number seven, which would be 7A, the flood insurance rate maps. Apologies, I gotta find the PDF. <coughs> All right. Good evening, members of the board and uh, members attending in the public. My name is Kent Walia. Senior Planner with the Development Services Department, reading into the record item 7A, an update to the FEMA flood insurance rate map changes presented to the uh, Planning and Zoning Board. So what is a, you know, a, a flood insurance rate map? It's also known as the FEMA flood map. It is a map that FEMA provides uh, communities that delineates the special flood hazard areas and base flood elevations throughout the city um, these, uh, this information is used to determine flood insurance. It's used to regulate the Florida Building Code and the city's land development regulations. The current effective flood insurance rate map is October 5th, 2017. And what's being presented before the board and the public today is that FEMA is changing their maps based off updated information, um, weather patterns have changed, and also advances in technology. The city is also a part of something called the community rating system as part of the NFIP. So 
uh, we get a discount on um, flood insurance premiums by implementing floodplain regulations and that provides a 20% discount to the city. So the city implements what FEMA provides for floodplain regulations quite stringently and also the Florida Building Code um, adopts the FEMA requirements and um, finish floor elevations and also flood proofing. So why do we regulate floodplains to protect people and properties to improve resiliency? Building up higher also keeps um, your habitable areas outside of flood waters. Um, as I mentioned, to reduce flood insurance premiums, if you get federally backed um, insurance, you get a 20% discount. And then access to grant funding that the city gets as well as being part of the NFIP and the CRS program and maintaining a current score. You're going to hear me use in some of the examples and the changes to the map um, things called VE zone, AE zone, X zone, and X500. That's just the percentage of flood waters that are coming in. You're 1% flooding, 2% flooding. You're going to hear terms like the 100 year storm and general information like that. And then BFE, which is base flood elevation, that's basically what FEMA says to build your structures to. Um, that's the flood water height. And Free board is a foot above that, and you're going to hear that term used. That's according to the Florida Building Code. And that's an additional layer of protection. So currently, the first flood maps were in effect for the community back in 1970. There has been five revisions. Um, throughout the years, revisions weren't as frequent. But as mentioned, due to the advances in technology, the rapid changes in hurricanes and the severity of the storms and whatnot, um, information is being updated, benchmarks are being changed, and um, we received our um, last map in 2017, and then the current ones are being proposed now. Um, so right now we're in the appeal period. So the updates in the maps include additions and modifications to special flood hazard areas, areas that are being um, added or removed like neighborhoods or houses parcels that are added or removed from the special flood hazard area or changes of zones altogether which i'll describe in just a moment <clears throat> so currently what you have on the left is the current flood insurance rate map i went ahead and just snapshot a portion of one of the map panels to kind of show you the changes so right here you see ae flood zone with a base foot elevation of six. That six is for this whole area. So, and then right here is another circle, which is a VE zone velocity zone, which means that, um, you know, the from the beach and the ocean, you have, you know, wave action that was coming here, but um, new technology determined that the dunes were protecting the properties along the coast. So because the elevation was so high, this VE went to X. So Looking here at the new flood map, the proposed, um, which is a preliminary flood map, it shows that this AE elevation went from 6 feet NAVD to 7 feet NAVD. So it went a foot higher in this area, and it went 2 feet higher in this area, went to an elevation 8. This V zone here, which was a velocity zone, went to X. What X means is that it's not in a special flood hazard area, um, so your likeliness of flooding is very, very minimal. So here's just an example of a property that was kind of in that um, 6 zone, that, that AE6 area that I was talking about. So currently it's AE6, 6 feet, NAVD. And when I say DFE, it's the design flood elevation. When I was mentioning that there's an additional foot from the Florida Building Code, that's where your finished floor elevation is. So currently with the flood map, it says finished floor elevation, if you want to redevelop this property, is 7 feet. With the proposed maps, because the base flood elevation is going to 8 feet NAVD, that means it's an additional 2 feet higher. Now, just to clarify, um, these are like topographic elevations above the base flood elevation. So your roads got heights already in there. So it's all relative to what the topographic elevations are in the area as well. So there's just a little illustration summarizing what I uh, discussed, some of the highlighted areas. VE is going to X along the coast. Um, BFE can go up to two feet in certain areas. Um, some areas are coming in the floodplain, some areas are being removed, 
and increased finished floor areas in certain special flood hazard areas. And as mentioned, it's to improve resiliency. So FEMA had came out with some preliminary maps at the end of uh, December of 2019. As we all know, the pandemic came in 2020. Um, there was a review period. FEMA was going with the county, getting with the city. And um, throughout that process, um, they provided the city, the city with um, preliminary flood insurance rate maps and a report. Those are all posted on the FEMA website. Also, the city has it a part of your Leg Legistar document as well, and we'll be putting it on the website. We also would have copies as well in the building department um, by planning and zoning. So right now you have an appeal period um, before the maps become effective. Keep in mind, this is the federal government that's issuing these maps. It's not a city-initiated map amendment. So the appeal process is what we're in and what I'm propose, uh, presenting before the board today. So if any community or individual property owner wanted to appeal the proposed changes after you review them, um, you can provide information to our building official, Steve Tobias, who's in um, today. And then you could, you know, basically um, discuss what information that you don't agree with. Keep in mind that if you're proposing to appeal the FEMA maps from the federal government, you got to provide data and documentation from an, like an engineer to demonstrate that the information proposed is technically incorrect. So you have to provide that analysis, you have to provide methodologies and assumptions. Now granted, we do have areas in the city that people might experience flooding and say, well, well I'm concerned about flooding on my street. Um, the city's uh, public works department you can talk to. There's a, um, a presentation that we're supposed to present as well. Um, the city is doing um, what it can do to mitigate flooding um, by increasing um, the seawall requirements, allowing for seawalls throughout the city to protect homes from uh, storm water and also in roads and canals by pumping water too as well. And then you got the Army Corps of Engineers and South Florida Water Management District that are managing your canals. Mm -hmm. So within the public areas, we're doing our best to mitigate flooding. But um, if a property owner would like to appeal the process, like I mentioned, uh, you have to get with the chief building official no later than Friday, July 9th, because the appeals are due to FEMA by the 15th. So you have that opportunity to get with the building official. His information is here on this slide. And um, there's also a flood insurance rate report that's got a lot of technical information. So before you are some links, we're also going to put those online as well. And as I mentioned, if you have any cons concerns about uh, flooding in the public areas, get with the city's public works department. Uh, we will be here available if you have any questions for us. And um, just to the public works department, if you guys aren't here, you guys aren't here, um, I'll just give a brief overview of what they were going to present. Um, long story short, they were just demonstrating what the city is doing, a part of their stormwater master plan. Um, you know, getting funding for infrastructure to make sure that roads aren't flooding. And the reason why you want to protect stormwater and your public rights of way is you don't want this water getting into your house. And you want to be able for emergency vehicles such as ambulances, fire, and police to be able to navigate through the streets. And also for you to evacuate properly too as well. Um, flooding can be very dangerous because not only can it um, harbor, you know, pesticides and chemicals and bacteria and all that stuff can also flood out your cars, get into your house, and also pop up um, storm sewers at times too as well. Um, here are some general um, projects, capital improvement projects that Public Works has done throughout the uh, city. Here are some current and proposed um, capital improvement projects that are ear based that help mitigate flooding throughout the city. And um, they also did a vulnerability analysis that, you know, kind of established certain um, requirements for seawalls. And they were talking about making the seawall elevation to be uh, between 3.9 feet NAVD and 4.4. And they determined that that foot for your seawalls on coastal properties could protect, uh, could protect homes from uh, wave action. And still water elevation, because sometimes you got king tides too as well, where the water elevation just goes higher. So you do have that information provided. Here's a general map of some of the capital improvement project areas. 
And um, that's about it. If you have any uh, questions for us, uh, we will be available to answer as best as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Please. Uh, did you say that the X area remains X? Uh, most of the areas that are X remain X. It's just that the VE area, which was, let, imagine the properties along A1A, those are going from VE, which was more stringent, to X. So it allows the minimum finished floor to be 18 inches above the crown of the road. I mean, do you happen to know the elevation of A1A? Average? Not off the top of my head. I have to look at the topographic requirements of that crown of road. Okay. Not okay. off the top of my head. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else on the board have any questions, comments? I just have one question. Um, does that give the public enough time to provide the documentation needed? I mean, this report was done in 2019, and now it's they've only have two weeks to submit. Yeah, it's kind of a sharp deadline. Um, we were provided the map information because of COVID. There was some delays, um, so we're giving the board an opportunity to provide those. Um, we'll basically come to us for questions so that we can gather the information, propose a, an appeal. I know Palm Beach County already put it before their board, I think a week or two ago, and they're proposing an appeal as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Will this also be posted on the city's website? Yes, we're we'll working on that right now to get it on there. Awesome. Many members of the public we can inform, we should. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. And with that, we can move on to item 8A, which, are, which is our first quasi-judicial item. Um, while staff is getting ready, I'd just like to ask my colleagues up here, is there any ex parte communication on this item, the Silver Ball Museum? No. The records show there was no ex parte communication. Uh, I can say. I spoke to Magellan this morning and uh, I had a question about uh, the item. Perfect. And I can say I have visited the site um, on numerous occasions. So I'm familiar with the site and I'm familiar with the interior of the facility. Perfect. Yeah. But the records, Me too. Ms. Morrison has visited as well. I'll let the record show there was no ex parte communication with Ms. Howell, Ms. Blankenship, and myself. Ms. Dossery? Yes, good evening. Sorry, my eyesight is terrible. I'm trying to navigate here to get you to the PowerPoint. All right, good evening. I'm going to introduce the uh, attorney for the applicant, uh, Mr. Carbone. You can come up. Good evening, Mr. Carbone. I'd just like to read the file number into the record. The file number is Silver Ball Museum 2019-182. Thank you. Um, for the record, my name is Louis Carbone. My address is 90 Southeast 4th Avenue, Delray Beach, 33483. I'm here on behalf of the applicant. Um, and I'll start off, I think we all know where the Silver Ball Museum is, and what this is, what we're, what's before you tonight is a, an amendment to a conditional use approval that occurred uh, a few years back. So we'll go through um, why we're here tonight a little bit further. First, to give you the location, obviously a lot of people have been there. Um, it's located in that railroad parking lot area behind Johnny Brown's. There's the outside. Okay, let's give you some facts about the property. PNZ data. It's located in the Central Business District, which is CBD. The overlay for the area is the Commercial Core Subdistrict. The land use is Commercial Core. And the existing use is Commercial Recreation Facility, which is a conditional use in the CBD. And as it is, has been approved uh, under the conditional use guidelines, it's used for arcade games, full service bar, food service, on-site entertainment, and event hosting. It's a little bit of history. Prior to 2016, it was just used as a vintage arcade game uh, facility. In October of 2016, the applicant received a conditional use approval to expand the business to allow 
full liquor bar, food service, occasional on-site entertainment, and some event hosting. That approved conditional use in 2016 also included um, a set square footage of 7,697 square foot for use. And of that, 1,339 square feet was dedicated to food and beverage services. In addition, as part of the conditional use approval, because they were adding um, restaurant and bar uses, an in lieu fee had to be paid. Um, and they calculated the in lieu fee, as you see in your, in your staff report, based on these, um, what, what relates to the restaurant and bar usage, plus a 10% area that's floating around, the, I guess, the, the use, uh, uh, um, the total use area. So at that time, the applicant en entered into an agreement with the city for in lieu parking. And you'll see that at that point, they paid a um, $10,140 per space, 12 spaces of $128,680 as an in-lieu fee contribution. Okay. What we're here for tonight is that there's been a, um, when the applicant made some initial improvements to the building, they added some extra square footage, which was not counted under the initial conditional use approval. And what that meant was they added a catwalk, which was on the second floor um, of 628 square feet. Um, so the request before you is to amend the a prior use, uh, conditional use approval to include this 628 square foot expansion. And I'll show you, this is the uh, interior of the Silver Bill Museum and this area up here, which I'm highlighting, that's the area that was added. And this is a floor plan for you of the first and second floor. And we've um, delineated that area on the second floor, which was added. That's 628 feet. Now, what's that used for? Well, they use that basically as a walkway to get from one side of the second floor to another, an observation area, a gathering spot. People look down and see all the games underneath. And then it's occasional as a dance area. Again, that's the area that we're talking about. OK, so again, the, requ the request is to add this additional square footage into um, the prior conditional use by a modification. And I want to just point out this amendment will not require any additional in lieu parking contribution. The change, it won't change the approval to the bar and, uh, bar and uh, restaurant use that was granted and there's no change in the current occupancy load for the building by this expansion. I think that's important because it's kind of a minimal expansion based on those cri that criteria. The item is before the Planning and Zoning Board because the Planning and Zoning Board can take action to modify an existing conditional use approval. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to go to City Commission if it's considered an insignificant expansion. And that's why I'd like to go through some of the reasons why we think this is a rather insignificant change or modification. First, the actual use of the area is for a catwalk or observation deck. There's no bar area or um, additional restaurant seating or anything like that here. So it's not an increase to the bar or arcade areas that was already approved. Second, um, Again, the food and beverage use area is not affected and remains at that 1,339 square feet as approved under the existing uh, conditional use. There's no additional in lieu parking, as I mentioned, or required for this expanded area. The occupancy load for the usage remains at 280 occupants. And as we submitted as part of the application as a traffic statement, there's no real uh, change to additional trips or any actual increase in um, uh, intensity as to the, based on that expansion into the area. So there's no increase in trips or impact the roadways or intersections in the area. And that was provided as part of the staff report. So we believe that that increase is a minimal increase, which gives Planning and Zoning Board authority to make a decision tonight to modify the existing conditional use under that criteria. 
Now, just to go back, um, there are required findings that you have to make when you look at amending a conditional use. And one of the fine, couple of findings here is that it will not significantly, as you see in your staff report, there's no effect on the stability of the neighborhood by this increase in or expansion, and it won't hinder development or redevelopment or nearby properties. So as noted in your staff report, there's an analysis that was done there's ample parking, municipal parking around the site, so this expansion's not gonna have any bearing on that. Uh, there's no site improvements required as part of this expansion, so there's no off-street additional parking needed. Shouldn't be any negative effects on the surrounding properties as a result. And there's no increase in the facility capacity, as I mentioned, by that expansion um, of that catwalk area. So positive findings can be made as to the criteria for the modification that we're asking for tonight. In addition, under LDR section 3.1, there are also positive findings that can be made, and, and these are all outlined in your staff report, and I'll go through them briefly. As far as the land use map, this, the conditional use is a commercial recreation facility, and CBD zoning, CBD zoning is consistent with the land use map. So that could be checked off. The second is concurrency. The site uses and meets all concurrency requirements as it relates to water, sewage, drainage, <clears throat> excuse me, solid waste and traffic standards. So that standard has been met. Consistency, as noted again in your, sta in your staff report, the expansion of the interior space meets plan objecti objectives to stimulate growth and development of small businesses that enhance the vitality of the downtown. And I think we can agree that the Silver Bowl Museum does hit that uh, mark pretty consistently. And the, as far as compliance with the LDRs, and I went through this earlier, is that as noted in the staff report, there's no additional in-lieu parking required for this uh, modification that's, that's asked for tonight. So that can be checked off. So again, all required findings have been made, made to approve the modification, both as to the land use map, concurrency, consistency, and compliance with the LDRs. Okay, so here are your justifications and what the applicant would like to put forward to you to approve this tonight. First, the expansion of use is insignificant. We're talking a 628 square feet, which is basically just a walkway and observation area. Second, that expansion doesn't affect the existing size of the bar or the cafe area. The expansion doesn't require additional parking or any site improvements. The expansion does not change the existing permitted occupancy, as I mentioned. And all required positive findings can be made as to land use, concurrency, consistency, and compliance with the LDRs. We ask that you recommend approval, and I'll note that this item went before the Downtown uh, Development Authority on June 14th and received uh, unanimous approval. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Carbone. Ms. Dostery? All right, good evening. Um, again, this is file number 2019-182 for Silver Ball Museum. Uh, our applicant was really thorough in er, presenting the details about the request, so I'll try to move through as quickly as possible and focus on a few things for consideration. Again, um, this is on the east side of the FEC rail corridor on Northeast 3rd Avenue, and the request is to amend the existing conditional use approval. Uh, staff had directed them to do it as a modification because uh, it didn't appear to be um, to the level of a significant change but if the board would believe this to be significant we could uh, it would be referred to the Commission then for approval instead of the final approval which you would be providing tonight rather than a recommendation So uh, the initial approval in 2016 was for the 7697 7, square feet of building floor area with the 1337 of uh, food and beverage service. 
and then the expansion was just 628 square feet on the interior space. We go from 17% of the area dedicated to food and beverage to about 16 with the expansion. And uh, one important consideration is the occupancy is fixed at 280 persons because of the available, available restroom facilities. If they were to expand that, then building could consider granting them uh, an expanded occupancy. But until that would happen, uh, 280 persons um, is occupancy. And so again, the area with the lines, which is not as clear as the applicant's picture, is where the area was expanded and that top floor of the building. And just to briefly go through some of the calculations for in-lieu parking, um, it was calculated, required for 1,975 square feet, uh, which was the cafe bar area and 10% of the remaining square footage, which could be, was staff at the time determined was uh, for any drink service outside of the designated cafe bar areas. The um, expanded area, we again, we figured tw about 10% of that 628 square feet would be considered for uh, beverage service. And um, parking is calculated at a rate of six feet per thousand for the restaurant and lounge use. And um, that comes to 12.22 spaces and we round down per the code. So that's the reason for not asking an additional in lieu. Um, these are the required findings for any development application. The only thing that may be important for consideration is just traffic, which again, as with the occupancy fixed at uh, 280, it's not anticipated to have any large impact. Um, 37 additional trips are anticipated to result from the expansion. And um, the applicable comprehensive plan policies are that uh, we're supporting our vibrant downtown and our small business life um, through this request. And the required findings, as um, our applicant discussed for conditional use, are that it shouldn't have a significant detrimental effect upon the neighborhood stability or hinder the development of nearby properties. Again, this is all interior expansion without any expansion of the occupancy. Um, it's surrounded by, uh, by parking facilities. The Downtown Development Authority did uh, recommend approval. And your options for tonight are to um, approve the request, approve it with conditions, or deny it, which would trigger the commission review and action. So if you have any questions, we'll be glad to answer them. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Dossery. Turn to my colleagues on the board. Comments, thoughts? Well, this facility is very important to our city. It's the only place you can take your kids, you know, when you're downtown. It's a great facility. Um, I totally support this um, since it really doesn't have any negative impact at all on our city. And it, it helps uh, a business that's very important to our city. Chairman, if we could, just a public comment. Oh, sorry, Mike. My apologies, Ms. Morrison. <laughs> that was not your fault, that's mine. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Um, can I ask you if any member of the public is here to comment on this item, would they please step forward? Seeing none, public comment is closed. Mr. Bennett, can I ask you, do, um, is there any rebuttal or, or cross-examination on this item? They would still have the same opportunity, yes, yeah, so if the applicant wants to speak on a rebuttal or any? I have nothing at this moment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carbone. Ms. Dossery, shall I assume the same for you? Correct. Thank you. I don't, I wanted to, I think I skipped this in the presentation, but this is a retroactive approval of the expansion that was already made. So it's it's been functioning with these extra 628 square feet for the past three years or two years. Perfect. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, just in the interest of moving things along, I, I think this one's a no-brainer and I concur with my colleague over here. And I'd just like to make a motion to approve if there's no further discussion. That'd be wonderful. What motion would you like to make? Uh, to approve the request to modify a conditional use approval for the Silver Ball Museum located at 19 Northeast 3rd Avenue to allow the expansion of the approved commercial recreation use, finding that the request is consistent with the land development regulations and the policies of the comprehensive plan. Second. Second. Discussion? Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry, I didn't have a chance to. No, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -oh. Ms. Blankenship has the floor. Thank you so much. 
Um, Ms. Dossery, just a quick question as far as the dancing component. Has engineering checked it to make sure that it's, ha it's appropriate for um, a load of that nature? Um, because I do see that the dead lookout observation area does extend over quite some, some distance. So I just wanted to make sure it was safe and engineering had looked at it for that, for that purpose. I don't know that engineering has looked at it, but building has reviewed it for structural integrity. And um, so they have not had any concerns with that. Thank you. That's all the questions I had. Thank you, Ms. Blankenship. Uh, great. We have a motion and a second on the floor. Diane, would you please call the roll? No more board comments. I don't see any. Are there? Mr. Zello? <coughs> the only comment I had is oh, that sorry. it <laughs> seems very apparent that. You have to jump in here. <laughs> okay. This is a de minimis expansion, and I would uh, be in favor. There seems to be no detrimental impacts, so I would be in favor of the application. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Zeller. Mr. Weinberg? I'm good. No comment. Just wanted to check. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, Ms. Miller. It's made by Joy. Uh, yes, and seconded by Ms. Morrison. Yes. Alan Zeller? Yes. Joanne Blankenship? Yes. Max Weinberg? Yes. Christina Morrison? Yes. Ms. Dave? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Dossery. Thank Mr. You. Carbone, good luck. Thank you. Great. We are now going to move on to item number 7B, which is the Greco parking lot. File number 2019-282, and uh, we have Ms. Issa. Mr. Chair, I must step down for this item, so I'm going to go in the back. That's fine. Ms. Morrison, just um, on the record, just state what the conflict is. Oh, yes. Um, the Greco family is one of my clients, and I've worked on this property with them. Thank you, Ms. Morrison. Uh, thank you, Chairman Davey. Uh, for the record, Elizabeth Issa, Senior Planner with the Development Services Department. And I'd like to enter into the record uh, city case file number 2019-282, uh, conditional use for the Greco parking lot. Do you have the uh, program up? Can we switch over to the... Sure. For the record, Michael Weiner, you have to give us a, a moment here. It's the first time we've been back <laughs> in person, so. Okay. All right, I've got to get my trigger finger. Thank you, Mr. Weiner. Go ahead. Uh, for the record, Michael Weiner with a business address of Broken Sound Parkway, Boca Raton, Florida. I'm here on behalf of the applicant, uh, Florida MAG Enterprises LLC, that's a subsidiary of the Greco Group, um, for a property addressed at 15 Southeast 10th Street, Delray Beach, Florida. Uh, the property is presently zoned CF, community facility, pursuant to the land development regulations, and also has a future land use map designation of CF, community facility. Uh, the property was previously used for storage of major uh, construction equipment, um, and will now be used as a private parking area for Greco Motors. Uh, Greco Motors has completed the purchase uh, some time ago. Uh, over the years, it was determined that PCBs had seeped into the soil to a level that required substantial environmental cleanup. This cleanup is now underway, and my client will see it through to its completion. Uh, the use we are requesting is for parking for a private use. So the, the, there will be parked there inventory vehicles from Greco uh, and Greco. Uh, this matter may look familiar to you because you had a technical issue with the CF uh, zoning ordinance and that required us to be before you in December of 2019. We had to demonstrate that the use being proposed was similar to the uses that are set forth in the code to allow it to move forward under CF. My client was successful in that regard it having been passed by this board and then once again passed by the City Commission in February 2020. 
Uh, the reference to our conditional use is under what's called special services. Sorry for all this technical language, but it was a technicality before. Um, our conditional use of special services that allows for privately operated parking lots, and that's what we are. Um, you'll also see this use is not alone in CF. Uh, conditional uses could be for other transportation needs, other vehicles, garages, refuge, transfer stations, bus stations, taxi dispatch uh, areas. So we're not out of the ordinary in CF. Um, our use is a private parking lot, and for the record, my client agrees to security lighting, proper maintenance, trash removal, no unloading by tractor trailers, locking and closing during non-business hours, prohibition of sales, and no location of vehicles by key fobs. In the staff report, you'll see those all listed. There are uh, two, three, four, five, six, and nine. There's a couple that we want to discuss with you, but we'll get to that at the end, okay? Um, while technically these are site plan issues and, and uh, your SPRAB board will be reviewing these items in detail as well as the full SPRAB plan, the Greco team wants you, wants you to know they're a good neighbor and you shouldn't have to worry about those technical points. Um, so they asked me to place this on the record. Uh, returning to the issue of conditional uses, CF allows for such private purposes and allows for these special facilities. I'm still going backwards and still forwards. There we are. Okay. Um, and uh, th that, that is uh, set forth in the purpose and intent of the Community Facilities District and in your LDRs. Um, the LDRs then require conditional uses to meet certain requirements, and you've actually heard them. You'll hear them again, 2.4.5e of the LDRs. The use should not have a significantly detrimental effect on the stability of the neighborhood and should not hinder development of nearby properties. I will demonstrate this when we review some of the uh, features of the site and the plans that we have submitted to the city already in connection with it. Unfortunately, in Delray Beach, we do not vote on the site plan and the conditional use simultaneously, something you might want to look into in the future, but we don't do it. However, you may rest assured that sufficient information has been submitted to the Planning and Zoning Department so that it can be determined that the project will meet all site plan criteria. Uh, the second portion of the requirements, um, uh, other than 2.4.5e, are in Chapter 3 of the LDRs, and they are four parts. Um, so the four parts are, the first one is, is, is really easily demonstrated, as I said, we are zoned CF and our future land use designation is CF. The second part concerns concurrency. As the staff report states, all of these are met. Now the traffic concurrency did meet it. It's been some time since we can come before you. There were a number of issues that had to be developed with respect to the site plan, but the traffic concurrency letter will be renewed. That'll be conditioned any site plan approval, so we know that is met, okay? So uh, one of the things I should say is that a parking, a private parking lot is one of the lowest generators of traffic anyway. So this is about the least amount of traffic you could possibly have on this particular property. Uh, the third part is consistency with the comprehensive plan, and we have no concerns there. In fact, um, policy NDC 2.6.4 says improve the appearance of the FEC and the CX railways, and I think you will see that in a moment when I show you some of the features of the plan. So our, we do meet the comprehensive plan requirements. The fourth requirement under Chapter 3 is a final review by SPRAB and City Commission to be certain that every single LDR requirement is met. As I've said, because of the process, we can't complete that review now, and the site plan is not within your scope, but it will be considered, and we must run that gauntlet before those other boards, before we could have any construction or get a building permit. As to the regulations that are within your purview, they are all met, and none of them are inconsistent with what it is that we're proposing tonight in terms of a conditional use. So let me show you this site. So that, the site is, is uh, unusual in its, its uh, uh, configuration. There's a larger sort of rectangular piece, and then there's a uh, very long triangular piece. Um, there are four buildings 
that were on the site, actually some of them had been pulled down, but originally there were four buildings in accordance with permits. Um, uh, the, marcel, the parcel marked as uh, parcel A to the north will remain green. It's going to be landscaped. You will see it in a moment. Um, the other, where those three buildings are either down or coming down, only one building will remain. So let me show you the site conditions as they existed. So these are site conditions. Uh, if you went by it today, got chain link fence. After all, it was construction storage. Uh, large trucks, some of them that had large cranes, some of them, even when stored, were 15 feet in the air. Uh, again, uh, only uh, chain link fence just parved from stem to stern, uh, paved from stem to stern. Um, this is the one existing building that will remain uh, and will be the uh, uh, place for uh, uh, the people on site who will be uh, tending to the cars, making sure things are locked up. Now, this is the new, that, that building you just saw, these are the plans that are submitted to the city for site plan as the building will be improved. Obviously, you can see the difference in what's going to happen. There'll be new facades, substantial improvements, uh, additional windows, um, obviously painting, new fenestration, uh, and uh, as I said, significant amounts of landscaping. Mr. Greg Molini, the architect, is here tonight to answer any questions on these plans, though I am sure, as you understand, SPRAB will be actually reviewing the plantings themselves and, and the other things that come before them on site plan review. But we're here to, the plans are far along with the city, so if you do have questions, we're happy to answer them. We're not trying to avoid any of this, we're just, obviously those, those uh, decisions are made elsewhere. Um, the overall site will be improved in this fashion. Oh, I'm sorry. So you can see a complete difference, certainly in terms of the frontage along the highways um, uh, for 10th Street. Um, you will finally have landscaping, not a chain link fence, uh, perimeter landscaping all around the building. Um, you'll have uh, drive aisles, trees, and other significant improvements to the property. And if you notice at the top of the picture, um, the triangle will remain as it is. Um, it's not going to be improved. Um, it, it will have its own landscaping theme. Uh, not only will we be addressing those things that have to do with the uh, exterior of the buildings, with the uh, sight lines along the street, landscaping, and other maintenance requirements for this site, but we'll also be addressing ingress and egress. Um, it'll be function much better. Um, some of the interior exits on, to the Osceola neighborhood will be closed. There'll be no cut-throughs. There is right now. Um, the only exits will be on 10th. Um, considering the fact that, again, it's a private parking lot, we won't be increasing any traffic to 10th. Um, this works out well for the neighborhood. There will be no commercial intrusion into that neighborhood. In fact, it'll be decreased. In other words, all the carefully crafted regulations of our LDRs will be followed. Um, we will not be detrimental to the neighborhood. We will not hinder redevelopment. Um, again, as the City Commission and SPRAB will make sure the project will follow the standards that meet uh, that requirements under the code for a site plan review. Um, under those circumstances and conditions, with respect to the conditional use, which is what you're looking at here tonight, we meet all of the standards that are required um, for approval. Uh, th there were two site plan suggestions. I, I know you might be interested in that. One of them is they wanted a wall. Well, there was a, they, there was a suggestion of a wall instead of a fence. We, we honestly believe that that probably would only be graffiti attracting. If there is a decision on things like that, we suggest that it be made by the Site Plan Review Board. That's, that's exactly what they're there for. Um, it just seems that, that that may hinder the amount of uh, uh, green that we have on the site. And 
may not really carry out the purposes that everyone would, would uh, hope to see for this particular site. Uh, with respect to signage, again, in fact, signage is a complete review only at Sprab Board. Um, we're just saying to you, we're not selling any cars there. We already told you we aren't selling any cars there. We have no need for any um, garish signs, but there may be some identification signs. Again, we just suggest that. Um, as I say, Mr. Molina and I are here to answer any questions you have, but I think given the uh, uh, staff's review of the site plan to date, and given what has been suggested and what we've said on the record, that we've met our requirements with respect to a conditional use, and we look forward to your recommendation. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weiner. Excuse me. Um, I missed something in the beginning of it uh, when Ms. Morrison said she couldn't sit on this item. I was about to ask my colleagues if there was any ex parte communication on this item. No. Um, I spoke with staff, and I have driven by the site multiple times. Mr. Weinberg? Once again, I visited the site in the surrounding neighborhood. Let me say I was contacted in writing by Mr. Weiner. I responded to him, and I received another email, a copy of which was sent to Ms. Miller, the, the board secretary, so I'm confident that's on the record. He as well. Emails him as well. Yeah, I also got the, the uh, email, but right. I did not respond. Yeah, I, got, uh, I received an email. I don't read the emails, but I received oh, yeah. Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm not going to ask Mr. Bennett if you receive it, but don't read it. You have to disclose it. <laughs> so thank you all for stating that. Ms. Issa, we're back to you. Thank you again, Chairman. Um, for the record, again, I'm Elizabeth Issa, Senior Planner with the Development Services Department. I'll be presenting the Greco parking lot conditional use to you this evening. Subject site is located at 15 Southeast 10th Street on the northeast corner of the intersection of the Florida East Coast FEC Railway and Southeast 10th Street. The site is currently developed with three warehouse buildings and associated parking lot. It is zoned Community Facilities CF with a land use designation of Community Facilities CF. On December 16, 2019, the Planning and Zoning Board reviewed a request for a determination of similarity of use to operate a parking lot for private use by an auto dealership to park an inventory of vehicles on a property within the CF Zoning District. The storage of vehicles is not listed as an allowed use in the CF Zoning District. The applicant identified similar characteristics between the intended use and a privately operated parking lot, which is allowed as a conditional use um, in CF. The Planning and Zoning Board approved the applicant's request on a 5 to 1 vote. At the January 16, 2020 City Commission meeting, the Commission voted a 5-0 to appeal the approval of the Planning and Zoning Board. And, um, and then on February 12, 2020, the City Commission considered the similarity of use and voted 4-1 to approve the request. The applicant is requesting conditional use approval to allow a privately owned and operated parking lot that will serve as overflow storage for Greco Motors, pursuant to the similarity of use determination made on February 12, 2020. The proposal includes 252 vehicle storage spaces, which include both tandem and, standum, and standard space types, and nine employee parking spaces for a total of 262 parking stalls on site. Improvements to the existing parking lot include new striping, landscape islands, and required site buffering to meet current LDR requirements. Two of the existing warehouses will be demolished and one 3,900 square foot warehouse will, um, will remain and will be brought up to meet minimum building and code requirements to allow for ancillary storage on the premises. The, structures will retain this, the structure will retain the same building footprint. And the applicant is also requesting three waivers um, for, uh, that are related to parking stall um, design in order to allow for the tandem parking spaces. Uh, section 3.1.1, the required findings uh, for granting a conditional use, um, they, the applicant needs to meet, um, sorry, the provide findings in um, the following four areas, future land use map, concurrency, consistency, and compliance with the land development regulations. As far as future land use is concerned, as I, as I mentioned, on February 12, 2020, the applicant requested and was granted a determination of similarity of use to operate a parking lot for private use um, while the storage of, 
which they were granted, and therefore the conditional use is required pursuant to LDR section 4.421D4. Uh, the applicant is required to meet certain concurrency standards, of which they are all listed up on the screen, as well as um, in your backup. Um, and as the applicant noted, that they do meet all of the concurrency standards. As the applicant noted, uh, the TPS letter expired um, on August 26, uh, 2020. And so they are in the process of getting a new issue, a new letter issued. We won't schedule them for commission until that is um, provided to us, but um, it's not expected that the, um, the numbers are going to change significantly. Um, as far as consistency with the comprehensive plan, there are some um, policies and objectives in the neighborhood districts and corridors element that, um, to, uh, that are in regard to, or, I'm sorry, that um, address the community facilities land use designation. Uh, while the intended use is a private parking lot that will not directly serve the public, it should be noted that the similar similarity of use has already been approved, and the conditional use approval allows for additional review and conditions to ensure compatibility with the surrounding neighborhood. The proposed project is designed to be consistent with the LDR requirements for CF zone properties, which also includes special regulations for enhanced buffering that are required when a property is adjacent to a residential zoning district, which does apply to this site. In addition to these requirements, staff has provided additional considerations for the board that include the provision of additional buffering and specific operational standards to protect the surrounding neighborhood. Also, um, there's another policy in the neighborhood districts and corridors element, policy NDC 2.6.4. That talks of, that speaks to improving the appearance of Delray Beach from the FEC and CSX railways. Um, as the subject site has not been utilized in recent years, allowing a development that requires additional landscaping will improve the visual environment along the FEC railway. However, the applicant has included the installation of a new chain link fence along the FEC railway. The provision of this type of security barrier, barrier would result in a missed opportunity to provide public art if a wall were installed to provide a more interesting and artist, artistic aesthetic for railway travelers moving through Delray Beach. Additionally, um, this policy, policy um, HOU 1.1.12 from the housing element states that proposals for new development illustrate compatibility with adjacent neighborhoods with respect to noise, odors, dust, traffic volumes, and circulation patterns in terms of their potential to negatively impact the safety, ha habitability, and stability of residential areas. If the development will result in a degradation of any neighborhood, the project shall be modified accordingly or denied. The applicant states that the vehicles will be individually driven and parked on the site by Greco employees between the hours of 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. As the vehicles stored on site will all be new, they will only be moved occasionally on a daily basis. The applicant also confirms that no lo loading or unloading of vehicles will occur on the property or the adjacent right-of-way. A note has been added to the site plan confirming this as well. And finally, compliance with the LDRs. If the conditional use is approved, site plan approval Complying with LDR sections 2.4.3 and 4.4.12 will be required. The site plan was reviewed initially by the city's technical advisory committee on August 26, 2019, and it's undergoing revisions. As for the conditional use, LDR section 2.4.5E5 requires that the city commission find that the conditional use request will not have a significantly detrimental effect upon the stability of the neighborhood within which it will be located or hinder development or redevelopment of nearby properties. On the screen, you'll see um, the adjacent zoning land use and use um, for, the, for the neighboring parcels. Um, there is single family residential um, across uh, on the rear, um, across the street on the rear of the property, um, as well as some single family to the um, to the east. Uh, there is a, there's a vacant lot that's owned by the city um, in between, but there's um, single family homes on the east side as well. Yeah. 
In addition to the enhanced buffering requirements for CF zone property adjacent to single family properties, the board should consider if further information and or site improvements should be provided to ensure compatibility with the varied characteristics surrounding the property, particularly the residential neighborhood and the FEC corridor. As such, staff has recommended these additional conditions that were provided to you in the backup. Um, and also, as noted in your backup pursuant to section 2.4.4C, the Planning and Zoning Board has the, um, has the authority to impose whatever conditions it deems necessary to ensure um, compatibility with the neighborhood. And these are the optional board action, move to recommend approval to the City Commission, deny the conditional use request, or continue with direction. And that completes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Issa. Mr. Weiner. I think, uh, public comment. At this, at this point, you should allow the oh. public. Okay, that's fine. Um, I would like to ask, is there any member of the public who has come here this evening to speak on this item? To please step forward and state your name and address for the record. Mr. Quillian. Hello, everybody. Good evening. James Quillian, 925 Southeast 2nd Avenue. The um, reason I'm here tonight is to support this per the neighborhood's request over a year ago. Um, the applicant hasn't changed anything. We like everything that he's doing. We actually requested that he do the some of the things that he's doing. And we didn't ask him to do it a different way. We wanted him to do it exactly like he's doing. And it seems like the city's tried to throw in a few changes that they think would make it better now as a resident right next you know, virtually right next to this property what we wanted first and foremost is the bob wire fence to be tore down okay and we wanted a landscape buffer to be put up that's what the applicant's doing we didn't ask for a wall we don't want a wall that really doesn't have a purpose that doesn't uh, it actually hardens the transition between commercial uh or the use as a parking lot and the residential so the city's like proposing that they, they build a wall. Um, now, we love art in our neighborhood. We love murals. But usually the purpose of a mural is to cover an ugly wall, okay? You can't get rid of the ugly wall, so you put art on it to beautify it since you're stuck with it. You don't build an ugly wall in order to put a mural on it. Who comes up with these ideas? They get actually paid for this? Come on. Everything that we wanted, we asked for, for from the applicant, and they said, yes, we will do what, you need, what you're asking because it makes sense. Everything. So why would the city want to try to change that? That would, you know, make the neighborhood a worse place to live. I don't understand why, that, why planning and zoning continually does that to our neighborhood. We want you to approve the application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Quillian. Yes, sir. Uh, Dennis Bajrak Taravik, 111 Stone Harbor Way, Village of Swinton Square. I have a couple questions uh, I th as far as what they're doing. I just got this in the mail, so caught me off guard. The photo looks nice. I agree. If you are going to proceed, I don't think there should be a wall. I think the landscaping would look nice in the area. However, is this property going to be used for... Um, extra vehicles only um, they have some they have a building in the middle is that going to be used for corporate are they gonna actually be workers in that building Monday through Friday is there because um, our sale because there's another location right next to Starbucks is that one going away and this is going to be the main storage vehicle lot for them no is um, let me see if because if there are salespeople who are going to be going to this location to get vehicles Typically, when you have a customer at the dealership, it could impact the safety of the, of the driving around that area because they're going to rush to get to that building, and that's a weird uh, intersection. So where would that entrance and exit be? Is it going to be in the same location? So these are, these are things that are, are kind of flowing through my mind right now because I don't know exactly what this is going to be used for because if it's just another lot to keep vehicles there and they're making that building just to make it look nice, um, then I oppose of it because all that's going to bring is extra theft because that's what happens with these vehicle lots. They're showing like 12 cars in that photo, but meanwhile, there's going to be over 200 vehicles on that lot. 
usually when there's that many vehicles in those little pockets in that area around there, there's crime. Because in my HOA, there be, they, with cameras and lights and everything that's been added there, people still come in and steal things from vehicles. So is this going to bring, someone might go to that parking lot and be like, oh crap, I can't get to there. They might come back into our community. Those are some of the things that, uh, that I would like answered. Yes, sir. Um, I think, did you look at the presentation this evening by the applicant, Mr. Weiner? Yes. Okay, so the driveway is going to stay in the same location and they will not be bringing customers to that property. Okay, I nor will they un be unloading or loading cars onto 18 wheelers or uh, car haulers um, either on the property or in the right of way on the road out in the street. Um, so I think that you, I think if you listen to the proposal and you look at it, um, you'll see that uh, a lot of your concerns have been taken into uh, consideration both by the applicant and by Mr. Quillian, who just spoke in front of you, who is, I believe, the um, Homeowners Association president for Osceola Park. Okay? Uh, Mr. Davey, with all due respect, I was listening to it. When a customer goes to a dealership, the salesperson doesn't take a customer with them to the lot to pick a car. They keep the customer in the dealership, and then they rush as quickly as they can so the customer is not waiting in a dealership for 15, 20 minutes while they do 35 miles an hour on Federal or, or 30 miles an hour on Dixie just to get to that parking spot. They rush as fast as they can to get to where they need to go to get that car, and then they rush back. I understand, I understand your concern. Um, obviously, the employees of Greco will have to meet the motor vehicle rules of this state. And uh, if it becomes a nuisance, I'm sure people in the neighborhood will alert our police department who would end that type of behavior quickly. Um, and I also did not hear the applicant that salespeople would be coming to the lot um, you know, to pick up cars and bring them back to the dealers. That's not what they envision um, the use of this facility for. So they're just going to keep 254 uh, units sitting on a lot, not selling them? Chair, I just... Excuse me. Yes. Yeah, I just want to remind that the public yeah. comments more of their right, comments and comment. interaction. Yes. But um, certainly the board can ask staff and the applicant some of these questions and concerns. I'm Thank pretty you. certain that Mr. Weiner is already calculating a response to many of these. <laughs> yes, I, would, I, I have hope a hope so, because I would like to know. Uh, I mean, Thank I'm not you. trying to, I'm not trying to, I want what's best for the community, what adds value to my, I, I'm a homeowner there. I want something that adds value. It looks really nice what they came up with. I'm not saying it doesn't. However, those are things that concern me. So if he could answer them, hey, that, I would that make me feel more comfortable, then I would, I would accept it. Mr. Weiner has appeared before this board numerous, countless times, and I would just say that I'm sure he's going to address your concerns, and you can probably also get his contact information when he leaves this evening. I'm sure he'd be happy to give it to you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. So that is the end of public comment on that item. I'll ask uh, Ms. Issa and Mr. Weiner for any cross-examination and then rebuttal. Uh, I have no cross-examination. Ms. Issa? Let the record show Ms. Issa has no cross-examination and Mr. Weiner does not either. Rebuttal, Mr. Weiner. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate both of the public comments. Um, as to the second citizen, he obviously seems to know a lot about car sales and the behavior of car salesmen. Um, not quite sure, but, but uh, uh, honestly, this is an overflow lot. The lot is stocked. The idea is in the mornings and in the evenings when cars are sold, um, then they will be restocked. Um, unfortunately, franchises being the way they are, uh, the car companies require that a certain amount of inventory be in the area. And um, if you hear from any dealer, the dealer will tell you it is far too much inventory, but the franchise says they must buy it, they must purchase it, they must purchase it somewhere. Um, if you were up on Okeechobee Road and you see the very, very large garages that began to exist and which are now 
probably the largest uh, uh, buildings on Okeechobee and most noticeable. This, thank goodness, what we're doing in the city avoids that kind of problem and still lets us have our dealership row, which is so important to south of, uh, of uh, Linton on Federal Highway. Um, security and other things will do as good a job as anyone can possibly do. And certainly if you store construction materials or anything else that that CFI site was there for, why did it have a fence that had barbed wire around it in the past if it didn't have those problems? So this is not unique to the storage of automobiles. They will do as great a job as they are. Um, and I am sure that the salesmen understand that their licenses are important to them, so speeding from one place to another doesn't seem like it's likely to be a reason for denying a conditional use. You've heard the criteria. We met the criteria. Um, but I really do appreciate it, and I will give you my card, and, I, and, and I'd love to hear from you further. Um, uh, I, I hope for your affirmative vote tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weiner. Is Issa? The rebuttal? Just wanted to kind of touch on the comments about the wall. Um, you know, the intent of the wall is to screen the parking lot, the visual look of a parking lot. Um, you know, it might be nicer to look at a wall than it is to look at a sea of cars. Um, and like the policy in the um, comprehensive plan states, we do want to improve the, um, when you're sitting on the train and you're going down, you know, it's like, oh, we just wanted to have a, a better look. And that's why we suggested the mural on, on the wall um, for that purpose to further that element in the comprehensive plan. So. Just wanted to touch on that a little bit. Thank you, Ms. Issa. And with that, I'll turn to my colleagues on the, oh, excuse me, Ms. Issa? And there, and it, there is a wall proposed on the front and the rear. So it's just a couple of, it's. So basically it's, you're uh, envisioning a three-sided wall against the tracks facing south and facing north? I believe in the staff report facing? it said the entire site, but you know, so that would also maybe be sufficient, you know, something to consider. But they do, they are already proposing walls. So it's not like we're just asking for that out of nowhere, so. Perfect. Thank you, Ms. Issa. Being said, I'll turn to my colleague, excuse me. Um, turn to my colleagues on the board for comments, questions. I have some questions. Mr. Zeller. I'm unclear about the wall. It appears that there's going to be a wall along the side of the railroad tracks. We ask Mr. Weiner? Please, if you'd like to ask the applicant to respond. Mr. Molina was sworn in. He is intimately familiar with the site plan, so. Um, Greg Molina, the architect of the project. And Mr. Architect. Molina, if you could just uh, please state your name and address for the record. Greg Molina, 2801 Southwest 3rd Ave, Fort Lauderdale. And I'm the architect with GBM Architecture. Thank you. Okay. So we are proposing a wall on the north and south parts uh, sides of the property. This is protect our blocking visions from the uh, driveways and from the residential area. And this is a decorative wall, uh, six foot masonry high. And uh, the walls in question that uh, we are being brought up are along the east and west, which is like 400 linear square feet of wall that they're asking. This is along the property, the railroad tracks, and then that's on the, on the uh, west side, and the east side is just a buffer area that's completely screened by trees. There's an easement there already. It's virtually impossible to see anything from the-, the So on the east side where the residence is that's Again. blocked, yeah, that's blocked by uh, an easement. That's a 20, 30 foot uh, wide easement. Okay, there. so there's no wall on that side. Just, we're proposing a brand new chain link fence. Is that going to be landscaped? Very landscaped, yes. Fully landscaped. Yes, we have, uh, just to let you know, at the moment, there's a total of 62 trees, 21 live oaks, 41 cabbage, palm trees. By the time we're done with the property, the project, we're looking at 209 total trees. So that's a substantial improvement okay. in growth. And there will be a wall on the west side adjacent to the railroad tracks. That is a screened, just a chain link fence. That's a chain link, chain -link fence. Chain link fence, right. 
So the only walls that they were talking about in the discussion here were on the north and the south, the front on 10th Avenue and in the back. They're the quite the question or street. what's being brought up is they want to add a wall along the railroad tracks, which a solid masonry wall, which we're not proposing that. We're proposing that, a brand new chain link fence. I see. So yeah. th that's the wall that uh, developmental services has Correct. referred to in their letter. Correct. Okay. Um, can you tell me, is there going to be a PA system or any type of um, outside speakers on this? I, I do not think so. This is a operational use, but I, don't, I do not believe so. There's no salesman. There. We ha are providing nine parking stalls, and that's just only for um, to, to meet the, the building code criteria, the zoning code, which re in reality it's only four. But because of the way the structure was, uh, the landscape, the, excuse me, the site plan was laid out, we have nine spaces. Uh, we're not, they're not looking at any employees, uh, salespeople working there, just two to three people. And uh, it's, it's uh, buffered landscape throughout. Uh, the site right now is probably 10% at the most, uh, green area. We're up 26, which is up and above uh, zoning standards. Is there stacked parking on the site? In, interior wise, not the tandem parking, just on the insides. All the perimeters are typical parking stalls, but in the center part, there's a few areas where there are tandem, two, park, two stalls, or two cars parked to, back to each other. And that's only because it's only uh, being used by one person or two people mm -hmm. that are moving the vehicle. It's not public. It's not open to the public at all. How do they find the car that they need to bring back? Is That's strictly operational. I'm not sure how they, they key everything in. But Is it, there like a noise said, associated with that? Is it, it's just a car. It's just typical parking lot, but not. it's not typical in, in a sense that our people are coming in and out. It's just cars that are being stored. So, okay. if, if, I, if I can address it, Michael Wonder, for yeah. the record. Yeah. This is, this is overflow, so they are not looking for a particular car. It's not as if they're looking for the white okay. uh, yeah. uh, automobile that uh, has... With the tan leather design. interior? <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, with the tan leather interior. <laughs> I get it. Thank and you. The special uh, rims. That's roof. the one. <laughs> uh, but, but on a serious note, they, that, that isn't what it's for. It's, it's to meet the requirements under the franchises so that they have, that they have purchased the appropriate amount of automobiles and then after there are sales at the lots, they take them from the lot and they restock the, the other area. Okay, and, and the only other question I have, will there be any painting or repairs or whatever that's done on this site? Oh no, there's, they wouldn't touch the automobiles. The, okay. the automobiles were already- the, the, These are the, brand new vehicles. Those skins that are on the automobiles when they transfer them, those are all off, then they're brought over there. And okay. uh, uh, as I say, it's just, uh, just storage. What are the other conditions that are listed on the ENZ report aside from that wall that you didn't agree? Oh, the only other one was, was signage. And, and again, um, it's not as if you're letting us free. We have to go before SPRAB, who is familiar with the signage regulations. And all we're asking is that, that there be some kind of identification on the lot. Uh, since there's not sales, we don't need to, we, there's, there's no request for neon signs and besides whatever the code requires is what we must do you're not you're not uh, letting us go on anything we don't have carte blanche okay thank you thank you mr zeller thank you sir thank you mr weinberg well, i do have a couple of questions please um one was an observation and i think it's on page two uh paragraph one in the second and third line is that a typo that the six foot high masonry wall, the simulated stone pattern will be installed along both the north, adjacent to southeast tent, is that the south side? That's what, that's what the applicant, uh, well adjacent to that tent. It's is the north side the of south southeast side. tent. Right, but the north side would be the rear of the property. Yeah, so here's the site plan up here. Southeast yeah. tent, right, is the south side of the property. Southwest 10th street where it fronts is the south end of the property. That's right. You go all the way to the north, that's the north side. The west side is against the tracks, and the east side buffers right. up to an easement that's the other side is residential. So that is a typo? Yes. Yes. Thank you. In that second line, that is a typo? Yes. Okay. Uh, what is the objection generally to four walls? 
uh, excuse me, we're, we're not proposing the four walls. That's, excuse me? We're not proposing the four walls. The zoning is. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah. What's the objection? Oh, the oh, objection. Well, the, the four, four walls. walls. Oh, look. We don't want it. <laughs> We've worked, if Mr. Quillian's speech was not sufficient enough, we've worked very hard to make sure that the surrounding neighborhoods liked what we were doing. Um, uh, for example, the ingress and egress. It might have been more convenient to have a, a, another uh, means of ingress and egress, but they really wanted some separation. Great. If we can give it to them, we shall. The, the walls get it back to looking probably more prison-like than some open area and that open area is more likely to have landscaping moreover those are the walls that are less seen and as a practical matter that just seems to be a, a graffiti magnet so under those circumstances if 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 we find that the surrounding neighborhood really enjoys that particular pattern and not no matter how we landscape it see a hardscape wall everywhere then that's what we'd like to try to do. And, and let me suggest to you, you know, if individually any person wants to weigh in, they can weigh in either at the SPRAB meeting or and when we're done with the motion, say what you think about walls. But basically the criteria here tonight is all about conditional uses anyways. And remember your SPRAB board has expertise in areas. That's what we've delegated. We liked that system. That's what we like to do. So may I suggest to you respectfully that we look at the conditional use. If you have a personal opinion, certainly express it, but it, it shouldn't be the, the reason one way or another that we're um, deciding um, what we have before us tonight. So thank you. And it's typically uh, not within the purview of this board to be presented with or make comments on a site plan. I, Yet you know, we've seen the site plan. I, I, this is, if, if I may, one of the things that's, that's, that I've gone through for decades here in Delray, some places it is all together. You do your zoning and conditional use and site plan all on the same night and you consider it. Mm -hmm. It's so difficult, especially when you have such site subjective criteria as 2.45E that says it shouldn't be detrimental. Well, how do you keep it from being detrimental? You start considering the site plan, but wait. When I go before SPRAB, they're going to say, oh, you already made the decision for me. That, <laughs> I'm, going to get, I'm going to get a shout about how it is that they don't necessarily have the freedom um, that they're supposed to have for site plan review. I think there are good intentions among all, all, everyone, and, and we should do our best to express them. And I will be the first to admit these are legal technicalities, probably going on too long. but. Don't let the legal de technicalities stand in the way. We're, we're, we're meeting the criteria. So thank you. You're welcome. Actually, I'm not referring to legal technicalities at all, but the aesthetics of two walls versus four walls, mm -hmm. the generation of the two walls, how did that come about? Uh, again, it, we've- Or is it irrelevant with, at this point? I, I have to get the microphone because I'm supposed to be on the record. Again, we've, we've worked with the surrounding neighborhood. They had some feelings about what should be there. We had some feelings about what made the place look good. It may differ from, again, any particular opinion up here tonight. Um, and it may, again, differ from what SPRAB has to say. And it may, again, differ from what city staff has to say. Typically, these things, what? We have approximately 20 opinions that we take into consideration, maybe more. And then at SPRAB, we'll hash it out and we'll see which of the opinions actually um, make it to the conditions of approval for, for site plan. I think we're focused on the wall because staff provides in the first uh, condition mm -hmm. for that, that uh, western wall. It seems to be an important component. Just jump in. I believe so, that the conditions that are on Excuse the- Excuse me one second. Mr. Weinberg, go ahead. Please finish your thought. Uh, that's why the questions wall versus chain link come up in the first place. I think the project is an attractive mm -hmm. project, certainly better looking than what's there now, without a doubt. Uh, but the city is making an effort with the railroad corridor to um, provide these murals. 
these artworks on walls that exist. Yes, it's true that you might invite graffiti as well. Some can, would consider that art. I suppose, though, if we are voting strictly on the conditional status, then we shouldn't have been shown a site plan at all. Huh. Because that really is an aesthetic that doesn't have anything to do. It goes to your point about the, the silo effect of the Planning and Zoning Board and SPRAB. Mr. Weinberg. We're making these these uh, uh, determinations in isolation. Let's leave the wall for a second. I do have a question about the- Mr. Weinberg, yeah. hang on one second. Um, I just wanna say that we've run into this on other items where we're shown the site plan as a part of an applicant's presentation. Correct. And um, while certain items on that site plan are, how can I put it? Um, certain items on that site plan are mainly the purview of the SPRAB board. It is not to say we have no say, and I think that it's human nature when somebody comes before you with and makes a presentation and shows you something, it's natural to offer an opinion, okay? You're right, and you're making say, my point, Mr. Chairman. Right, so. Thank you. Kind of my thing is, is that, listen, Personally, let me just state on the record, I prefer 72-inch decorative aluminum and heavy landscaping, okay? But that's kind of immaterial. Let's kind of keep ourselves focused on the, um, if we can keep ourselves focused on the conditional use approval. And we all know, we all have friends who are on the SPRAB board. And uh, if we wish to share our opinions, we certainly can. <laughs> But um, I think that having a discussion about this, there's still, they have two stops after us. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we get bogged down here in a discussion amongst us, I don't want to see us get bogged down here on this board where one person thinks it should, they're fine with three walls, I might be fine with one wall, some other person, the night is young, we have a long agenda, let's try to stay focused on what we're on. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Please. I'm not offering any opinion, I was offering a question as to why two rather than four or three or none at all. Uh, so it's not my personal opinion uh, regarding chain link or masonry wall. What I'm responding to is the nine conditions that staff uh, deemed important enough to illustrate in the way they did. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure that Sprab will determine whether that masonry wall is appropriate or not. Let me move on, though. I have a question that you brought up earlier regarding the uh, uh, environmental uh, remediation. What stage is that at? Um, most of Phase. it has been done. I do not believe that the letter has been obtained yet from... Um, DEP? What's that? From DEP? Yeah, from DEP. Was that phase one, two, three? Oh, no, it was It was originally a phase two. That was, you, you know, it had nothing to do with what... You, we were it involved. wasn't your use that caused the contamination. What, what, this what was... What had occurred was that FPNL, even before the storage of the equipment, and, the, and then they leased it to somebody else, bless them, <laughs> um, but um, they had PCBs in their uh, transformers that right. leaked. And all of that has been supervised. Mo most of the asphalt has been removed. I just can't say that I know as of today. But before we would get any building permit, we would obviously have to have. You would have to prove final. remediation. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, and one more question. Mm -hmm. What is bullpen parking? Bullpen parking is, is it, it, when you lay out a shopping center or parking lot, um, there are specific rules in every single jurisdiction. Ours, and, and uh, I can be corrected if I'm wrong, I think we're allowed 12 in a row, and then we have to have a, a island. An island permit. Correct. Uh, right. you, yeah. Yeah. So, um, and then there have to be islands in between. Mm -hmm. This is, its sole use is private parking. No one is going to be there. The, only the four employees are going to see the inside of it. Um, and I'm sure, as I say, there'll be landscaping. Uh, to whatever requirements are so that people are not staring inside. So it's a more efficient use to have the parking 
tandem with each other and not have that regulation, the same regulation that would be used for a, a shopping center. Right, so tandem is back to back. Back to back. Both pen is the, uh, the accumulation of 12 to 15 cars in a row. Correct. That's the bullpen. Yes. If I All right, thank you. Go ahead. To you. Um, the bullpen occurs right in front of the building, which is the, uh, the south side. So you notice that there's like a U-shaped parking lot. It's blocked by nice big and three side platforms. This is the bullpen area. Right. So it's that sort of enclosure of the landscape areas. Mr. Chair, I'm yes. not going to be able to hear this. Oh, thank you. I would. That's all I have. <laughs> I'm a walker when I talk, too, so. Sorry. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Mr. Weinberg. Anything else? No, that's all I have. Ms. Blankenship. Thank you, and I apologize for speaking out of turn earlier, Mr. Weinberg. No offense. Um, I was just going to say at that time that, um, and with all due respect to the staff and an appreciation of their thorough staff report, that the nine um, items that are listed on that page of the staff report are just suggestions for conditional use that we may consider. Of course, there's things that aren't on that list that we could also consider if the board chose to do so. So that being said, they're not required um, at this stage, nor are they required at any stage. It was just recommendations by the staff on things we could do. So um, just putting that out there. Uh, a question for the applicant um, in, in relation to the public comment we received about the parking lot that is uh, behind the Starbucks. Will that parking lot that's currently being used by Greco stay that way or will it be gone? No, that was done under the temporary parking rules. Yes. You, are, you are really, you, you watch your temporary parking <laughs> rules. So I don't know when the date is that it will end, but um, on the date it will end, it, it, uh, uh, we'd either have to come back here for for another temporary permit or close it. So, just wanted to make sure we addressed that question from um, yes. a member of the public. Um, and as far as uh, any walls or, or public art that's on them, um, I think that's probably out of the purview of this board, so I don't have an opinion on that. Um, the Greco family and the Greco uh, car dealership has been good neighbors to um, Delray Beach. And um, as far, in my view, as far as I can see, they've never gone back on what they said they were going to do and they've kept their commitments um, in their word. So uh, in, in this respect, I think it's a vast improvement over what was um, on that site before. Uh, they've gone and cleaned up something that was um, you know, d uh, environmental hazard, um, they're beautifying the space. So and for all those reasons, and for everything that we heard in the previous, um, when they came back before the change for the conditional use for the, the community facilities, I would uh, be recommending approval. Thank you, Ms. Blankenship. Ms. Howell. No comments on, on this specifically, um, but just an observation that over and over again, we come up against this, the siloed bifurcation and I wonder at what point or if it would ever be appropriate for us to recommend to the city commission that they consider the, the responsibilities of SPRAB and PNC and explore some sort of consolidation. Well, on the, that topic could be explored, but not <laughs> on Mr. Weiner's dime. <laughs> but not on Mr. Weiner's dime or yeah. the Greco family's dime. <laughs> Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. Oh, yeah. There you go. His comments on that were very much on point. You pointed out how what an extra burden it is for applicants. We do not offer one-stop shopping here <laughs> in Delray Beach. If I might for a moment, I, you, everyone knows my, my linkage to the town. It, it's, I could come before here, I could give you a long speech saying, you shouldn't even look at that, and I could point you. All of you would look at me like, what is he trying to hide? Mm -hmm. Then on the other hand, if you go into it, honestly, I've been before SPRAB and they have looked at me saying, you know, I can't do what I want to do because it's already approved this way. I don't, honestly, you're all public citizens. Look at the issue. It is tough on us. We, we don't want to try, be looked at as hiding. On the other hand, you, we, we are one of the few cities that have board a board with people that are designated for their expertise to sit on it. And that makes us unusual. Enough. Thank you, Mr. Weiner. Um, the only thing I will say is um, I am completely in favor of this uh, application and it is going to be a vast improvement compared to the old FP&L storage lot. 
or a fire training facility. <laughs> okay. I'm sure the residents will be much happier with a quiet, quiet parking lot than a fire training facility. And um, as to everything the applicant is pro uh, proposing, it is certainly better than the uh, old penitentiary motif that currently exists at that site. So um, I would also be in favor of approval. And I'm looking for a motion from I'll make a motion. Can I make a Mr. Weinberg? I've never made a motion. I'll make one. There you go. All right. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Hi. Ms. Alvarez. Hi. Good evening, Amy Alvarez, oh. Development Services. I just wanted to make a point of clarification just based on all the discussion. I'm sure everybody's Please. already cleared on, clear on it, but this is a conditional use. So it's not just looking at the use absent of any site improvements or of course. anything associated with the use because, again, um, you are able to apply conditions to ensure compatibility of the use. And, uh, so that there's no impacts around um, to ensure consistency with the comp plan. Mm -hmm. So that's where our uh, wall addition came from for the west side, maybe adding some um, public art there. Um, the list of board considerations are just that, something we thought that um, would help to guide to ensure the compatibility of the use um, and just again for clarification on the wall, we were, <laughs> we didn't write this up saying, oh, let's just wall it off and just of look at something very blank. You know, we did say in combination with landscaping, soften it up, you know. So everything was for the intent or with the intent of um, protecting the neighborhood, helping the neighborhood, sure. not going against what the neighborhood wanted of course. by any means. Um, and then. Regarding the signage, we're just saying no signage or advertising to be placed. Yes, there are signage requirements in the code, but if you'd like to limit that, given the use, you can do that as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll look to my colleagues um, for how to handle this. My, let it be put on the record that my own personal opinion is I would like to see the minimum amount of signage on the site maybe Greco Motors or something like that, but personally I'd rather see it, the SPRAB board make the decisions on that after they have input from everybody. And uh, as far as the um, fencing or the wall, my own personal belief is we should also leave that to SPRAB, but I think all of us on the board are free to contact uh, our uh, acquaintances or people on the SPRAB board to let our point of view known. I mean, personally, I wouldn't mind seeing a wall on the west side, but if it was up to me, I'd rather see decorative aluminum put them extra money into landscaping rather than building walls. But that's just my own personal opinion. I think, like Ms. Clark spoke to us early th earlier this evening, I'd rather see more green space than using use of more concrete. But that's just mm -hmm. my own personal opinion. So um, with that being said, Mr. Weinberg, do you want to go ahead with your motion or amend it? <laughs> I'm ready, yes. Uh, until such time as spread and planning and zoning are coalesced <laughs> in one board, uh, you I go would home make the motion uh, <laughs> to uh, move to recommend approval to the City Commission of a conditional use request to allow a privately operated parking lot for private use for the property located at 15 Southeast 10th Street finding that the request is consistent with the land development regulations and the comprehensive plan. Second. Can I have a point? discussion? Oh, excuse me. Point of clarification. Does yes. that include the non-conditions in the report? A friendly amendment. Uh, yeah, well, that would be continued with direction, I would guess, wouldn't it? Mm. That would be, um, I think that the applicant, and I typed it, but I think I might have closed that tab, um, the applicant had stated he was in favor, he was already agreed to do a number of items, and as I recall, but I may be incorrect, there was three items you were waiting to discuss. I would ask the applicant's agent, Mr. Weiner, to please come back to the dais and clarify that. There's only two items. Allow SPRAB to make the decision, the final decision on how many walls and allow SPRAB to make the final decision with respect to uh, the signage. Mr. The Pitt. others that we would agree to. 
we agreed to them far in advance of this. I, I, I don't want to make it seem like we were, sure. we were dealing for it. So basically it's items, uh, you would be willing to abide by all the items on the list except number one, provide mm -hmm. a masonry wall, and the last one is number eight, no signage or advertising, correct? Correct. Correct. Chair, I think number two um, involves a wall on the western property line, so number two would be... One, two, and eight. ...be void, basically, if one's not... Okay, thank you. But I think for the record, we should just say with the uh, nine items uh, proposed in this P&Z staff re report, less items one, two, and eight. And we remember... Uh, Mr. Chairman, for clarification and on the record, Please. that then will be decided uh, in the application before SPRAB, I guess. We'll well, take those I up. assume they would, I'm assuming they're going to keep the staff report the same. Yeah. And the staff report would then, you know, staff is obviously going to highlight to them they've already agreed to six items. We have three that we want to present to you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So does the motion include as a point of clarification items three, four, five, six, seven, and nine? Correct, as yes. As conditions. As as conditions. Okay. To Mr. The Weinberg, would you accept that as a friendly amendment? Or to Mr. What Weinberg, you would you accept adding to recommend conditions approval with one, those two, and nine as conditions correct. accepted and those three uh, to be taken up by SPRAP? Correct. Yes. You agree to the change? I do yes, he does. Okay. Who was the who was the original second, or did we get there? Uh, Mr. Zeller was the original, the original second, okay. um, but I, he wanted a point of clarification. Mr. Zeller, do you keep your second? Actually, I seconded it. <laughs> Yo, Ms. Howell seconded yeah, it. Oh, Excuse no. me, Ms. Howell seconded it. I'll keep my second. Yes, yeah, she'll keep her second. Okay. Okay. So the motion was by Mr. Weinberg, amended to include the list of one through nine, less items one, two, and eight. The applicant, th that's how we're passing it, and Mr. Weinberg made the motion, and Ms. Howell was the second. So when you're ready, Diane, is that acceptable to you, Mr. Bennett? Just for the record, since we have a court reporter, this, these are the items one through nine listed in the city staff report, and those are the same conditions that Mr. Weiner previously said he was in agreement with. Yes, let me just also add, uh, the conditions, the nine conditions are on the top of page six in the staff report. That's what we're voting. So we have a motion and a second. Whenever you're ready, Diane, you can call the roll. Joy Howell? Yes. Helen Zeller? Yes. Joanne Blankenship? Yes. Max Weinberg? Yes. Christina Morgan? Yes. Great. Thank you, Ms. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Weiner. Thank you. Um, and somebody please tell Ms. Morrison she can come back and join us. <laughs> Thank you for the spirited conversation on the bifurcation. I no do problem. appreciate that. <laughs> right. Welcome back, Ms. Morrison. And with that, we can move on to item number 9C. And Mr. Poppy is coming in to speak with us on the PHG Delray Platt, file number 2021-007. Thank you, Chair. Let's see. I cannot see anything up there. My eyes are so bad. Uh, can somebody help me? <laughs> Well, we're back in person. We're seeing how bad everybody's eyes. I was just gonna. I was just gonna oh, say. I, well, everybody's I have prepared. I, I knew it was at the top right hand corner, but it looks like it's been moved around now. I see a lot of people squinting. Can I ask how is the city's vision plan? <laughs> we just need time to use it. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Chair. Sorry for the no delay. Problem. Uh, I have a doctor's eye doctor appointment Thursday, so maybe I'll, I'll get a little, little help. Hopefully it goes well. <laughs> yes. uh, for the record, Scott Poppy, principal planner for the city of Delray. Your next item is the PHG Delray Platt. 
It's located at the northwest corner of Northeast 2nd Street and Northeast 5th Avenue, which is uh, Federal Highway, southbound Federal Highway. Uh, the applicant's here over uh, his presentation. Second page. Second. Please. Do you want to answer? Do you want to answer? Is that it? Yep. Thanks, sir. Yep. Mr. Covelli, before you start your presentation, you could just get your set up. I want to ask my colleagues if there was any ex parte communication on this item. None. No. No. Let the record once reflect. again. Once again, I visited the site. <laughs> Let the record show that there was no ex parte communication on this item with anybody on the board who's present tonight, with the exception of Mr. Zeller, who visited the site. And saw all the streets that are closed off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mike Cavelli, 1209 South Swinton Avenue. Um, I did not bring a site plan tonight. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Um, you promptly put it in your case. <laughs> yeah. No, this, this is kind of the end of a very long process in terms of the plat. Um, mm -hmm. There were four parcels of land assembled and, and put together in this. The first hearing we went to was a waiver request with the commission that was for an underground setback for the parking garage. We then went to SPRAB and got site plan approval and certified the plan. We then went back to SPRAB with an amendment to the certified plan and recertified the plan. And we've been to commission twice now for easements and agreements. And if you look at your, the, the plan view of this, and you probably can see it on your screen, but you can't see it here, you'll see that there are some blank spaces um, where the utility easements and, and general utility easements are. Those have been approved by commission by separate document. I just got the recorded ones today. So from this meeting, should you be so kind to approve this, um, we will fill those in, create the mylar, get all the signatures, and then it'll go to commission for final approval and then recording. And that's the last step in completing all the documentation before we actually go to full, construct, full vertical construction. Um, it's been a long process. If you would not even see this plat tonight, if it wasn't for the fact that we dedicated right of way on Fourth Avenue in a corner clip, this would have been considered a minor subdivision. But because we submitted, we had to dedicate right of way. It's considered a major subdivision, and you would see it. If we didn't dedicate right of way, we would have gone straight to commission and not come to this board. So it's it's pretty basic. It's kind of the the housekeeping at the end um, and having come at the end and, and having the, the changes in the site plan, we're sure that this matches what is on the site plan and the easements that are necessary. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Thank you, Mr. Cavelli. Mr. Poppy. Okay, I will definitely try not to repeat uh, the information that Mr. Cavelli gave to the board. Um, just to, I want to add a few items. Um, there are no conditions of approval, so um, we, it's just a straight recommendation on the plat. Um, again, it's located at the northwest corner of Northeast 2nd Street and Northeast 5th Avenue. The approval was for a 143-room hotel, and they're now asking for the, the, the plat to go along with that site plan approval. A normal oper operating procedure is to get your site plan approval. You, you set down where you think you need your easements, and then you follow up with the plat. So this is really kind of the last step before we can issue their, um, their building permits. Thank you. 
So there's the timeline of their approvals. The SPRAB approved the class five. The, um, the findings of concurrency were made as part of the class five, that there's enough traffic, there's enough water, sewer, et cetera, et cetera, as part of that class five. That's the elevations of the hotel. Again, it's, you're reviewing the plat, not the elevations. And I do want to make one, there's, there's a corner clip that Mr. Cavelli mentioned, and there's also um, a couple other uh, uh, agreements that are associated with the, the plat. And that's a five foot dedication along Northeast 4th Avenue, a, uh, a, a sidewalk dedication along uh, Northeast 2nd Street. But on page two of the staff report, I wanna make a clarification. Uh, there is a mention of a six foot pedestrian sidewalk easement dedication along East Atlantic Avenue. Obviously this is nowhere near East Atlantic Avenue. It meant, it meant to say Northeast 2nd Street and they have a general utility easement and a 12 foot sanitary sewer easement. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Poppy. Can I just ask you before we move into public comment on this item, um, was I correct in hearing that the only reason this is coming to us is because of the dedications? The yes, that, that is correct. Uh, there's two litmus tests for a, a major plat. One is dedication of right away. And the second is extension of uh, mains, water and sewer mains. Those are the two litmus tests. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Let me now ask, is there any member of the public who is here tonight who would like to speak on this item? Seeing none, public comment is closed. And I would now ask, um, the applicant, Mr. Cavelli, do you have any cross-examination of Mr. Poppy or any rebuttal? No cross-examination. Thank no you. Rebuttal. I'm going to ask the same for Mr. Poppy. Same, none here. Great. Uh, let the record reflect that the applicant and Mr. Poppy of city staff, um, neither has cross-examination or rebuttal. And we can now move into board discussion and board comments. And it looks like Ms. Morrison to my left wants to be number one. <laughs> I'll be number one. First of all, I want to make it perfectly clear to anyone listening to this, uh, because there was some misunderstanding online, that this hotel was approved two years ago. We're not approving a hotel tonight. That was approved way before this. All we're doing is approving a plat to put the par parcels of land together to make this the beautiful property that's envisioned. That's all we're doing tonight, and I heartily recommend we do this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morrison. Starting on the left side, Mr. Zeller. I have a question of, of, I suppose, Mr. Pappy. Does the city approve every request for road closures that are ever made? I understand we have this ordinance that now lets them limit it to, to two weeks. Excuse me, Mr. Zeller. They approve this. We, we, we really do have to stick on the plat approval. And I understand, listen, I have frustration you know, with traffic know, too. But we're precluded from having a workshop with with staff to ask these to ask well, these I'm questions. Gonna, just going they put to a sign. Yeah. They put a sign that the road is closed after the road is already just, closed. Mr. Zeller, what we're talking about. I don't here get it. I don't say, get it. What we're talking about here is a plat, and what I'm going to say. I understand. Is that, we're looking at a lot consolidation. I have no right. objection to the lot consolidation. Mr. Reminder, we have board yeah. comment at the end. If yeah, we have board comment at the end, exactly. At the end of the evening, you can feel free to bring that up okay. to Ms. Poppy. That might be a more appropriate time. Okay. Is there anything else? I'll add it to my list. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Mr. Weinberg. No questions. Ms. Blankenship. None for me. No questions for, None for me. From Ms. Howell no. or from myself. So that being said, who do I look for for a motion? was willing to make it. I can make a motion if you want. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Julian, you want, Julian, you want to do this one? 
Okay. <laughs> um, move approval of the preliminary plat and recommendation of approval to the City Commission for the certification of the final plat for PHG Delray, finding that the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets criteria set forth in the land development regulations. Motion by Ms. Morrison. Second. Second. Second by Ms. Blankenship. Diane, if you could please call the roll. Joy Hall? Yes. Colin Zeller? Yes. Kimberly Blankenship? Yes. Max Barnhart? Yes. Christina Morrison? Yes. 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 Thank you, Mr. Cavelli. Thank you, Mr. Poppy. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. And with that out of the way, we can move on to our legislative items in Section 9. And we have Section 9A. And that will be presented by Ms. Slasky. Good evening, board. For the record, Deborah Slasky, Senior Planner with Development Services. I will be introducing item introducing and presenting <laughs> item 9a it is an ldr tax amendment associated with domestic animal services it is ordinance 1721. so the request in front of you is a recommendation to the city commission on ordinance number 17921. the background on this um proposal in front of you is that on April 6, 2021, the City Commission directed staff to propose changes to the LDR to address services for domestic animals. If you have any questions about the meeting or the discussion between the City Commission, I'll be able to provide a brief discussion or analysis. Uh, the, intent of the, the intent and purpose of this ordinance is to support and encourage high quality domestic animal services while mitigating impacts into residential uses and neighborhoods. So in the LDRs currently we allow kennels, vet clinics, and pet groomings in terms of um, establishments and services that provide um, that type of care and service for domestic animals. Those uh, changes in the LDRs were in introduced or changed in the, in the 1990s, so it's been a while since uh, we have touched this subject in the city. Currently, we allow kennels in um, the more industrial area, which is industrial for I and MIC for mixed industrial and commercial. We allow vet clinics in other districts, which include neighborhood commercial, NC, general commercial, GC, CBD as a conditional use, and my um, mixed residential office and commercial, MROC, professional and office district, POD, and all of those uses are allowed as a conditional use, which is exactly what you just saw with Ms. Issa for the Greco parking lot. Um, pack rooming, it is allowed by right in GC, General Commercial, CBD, and in OSHAD. If you were to open the LDRs today and try to find um, pack rooming as listed in OSHAD, that would not be listed as an allowed use because in 1990, there was a similarity of use that was approved by planning and zoning that allowed pet grooming in OSHAD as a personal service. So what this text amendment is doing is just uh, bringing that information forward and allowing, even though it's not listed as an allowed use, but it is currently allowed. And we do have a definition for vet clinic in the LDR, so we're not changing it, but we are introducing new definitions. So what is this text amendment doing? It is a revising the code requirement in 433, which is um, currently only has um, one requirement for vet clinics. The requirement is that carcasses cannot be located on site. This text amendment is providing um, a lot more perimeters and requirements for uses associated with domestic services, domestic, domestic animal services. So, the first definition that I'm introducing to you is domestic animal services. This definition is just a broad definition of all the uses um, that are associated with animal services. So this definition includes pet clinics, pet services, pet hotels, and animal shelters. Here we have four new definitions. The first one is just a definition for domestic animal which is historically domesticated companion animals, such as dogs, cats, birds, and other tamed animals. Then we have three new definitions being added, which 
are more associated with uses. The first one is Animal Shelter, which is a county, municipal, or public animal shelter, a duly incorporated or organized nonprofit organization, operated as a bona fide chari charitable organization under the specific section, um, devoted to rescue care and adoption of spray abandoned or surrounded animals, which does not breed animals. So breeding would not be allowed. Then we have Pet Hotel, which is also known as a doggy hotel. Um, so establishments providing daily overnight accommodations for domestic animals. So this one is your pet hotel, which can accommodate day and night accommodations. Then we have a new definition being proposed for pet services. This definition is for services for domestic animals, which includes grooming, bathing, training, and daytime boarding. So pet services is currently allowed under the grooming definition in the code. We're allowing those uses to continue, but we're also adding the daytime portion. So um, with section 433, there's some provisions being added. So for all the uses that we just, that are, we just um, discussed under the definitions, all of them would have to comply with this slide. So one of them is outdoor activities would require conditional use approval if allowed in that zoning district. Um, no on-site disposal of carcasses are allowed. That is the current requirement and we're just carrying that forward. Separate refuse disposal shall be provided. So for example, if you have a grooming establishment um, next to a, a business office, that grooming establishment has to provide its own refuse um, facility or disposal separately. It can be indoors and then they just roll, out outdoor, uh, roll it out outdoors at night, but it has to be separate. And uh, that's a new requirement. Any uses that are not compliant with this requirement, it would be considered an existing nonconformity, but future users would have to comply with it. The hours of operation are from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., excluding veterinary clinics. The parking requirements proposed are um, for pet services and vet clinics, it is five per 1,000 square feet of gross floor area. For pet hotels and animal shelters, it is one parking space per 300 of um, gross square footage. So this slide, it pertains to overnight boarding. Overnight boarding is only allowed for vet clinics, pet hotels, and animal shelters. The requirements that they are required to comply is structural building standards to minimize noise and odor from outside. They would be required to have an on-site attendant. Pet hotels and animal shelters shall not be located within a mixed-use building with residential uses. So let me think of a building that we can use it as an example. A residential building with ground floor retail and, and res residential on the second, third, fourth story, you could not have um, a facility that provides over overnight boarding on the first floor. It has to be its own building, has to be separate from any residential uses. Uh, generators are being required for vet clinics, pet hotels, and animal shelters. For outdoor use areas, only vet clinics, pet hotels, and animal shelters can provide outdoor use areas when approved through a conditional use. When a facility provides outdoor use areas, they, they're prohibited from providing individual enclosures. A solid wall or a privacy fence six feet high shall be provided on all sides, including sides visible from the right of way. Previous outdoor use areas may, count it, may, may be counted towards the open space. The hours of operation are the same as mentioned previously, previously from 7 until 8 p.m. And that would exclude individual walks. And then in this provision, we are including separation requirements from like-to-like -like uses from residential districts and from adjacent properties. This table depicts where these uses are currently allowed and how they're proposed to be amended based on the current, based on the proposed text amendment. So as you can see, vet clinics are not being substantially changed. It is being only added in OSHAT as a conditional use. Past services, it is being added um, 
as a permitted and conditional service in OSHAD, and I'll explain what the conditions are in a little bit. Uh, let's see what else. In the neighborhood commercial, it is also being added as, a, uh, added as a permitted use. And in PCC, it is also being added as a permitted use, pet services, which is your typical grooming. Um, so the big change here is the pet hotel and shelters with and without outdoor use areas. So those are being, uh, being added in new zoning districts. We have a few maps that show that information. I'm actually gonna pass them around just because it's a little bit hard to see on your slide. Um, I can give it to you later. I have two extra copies if you need that again. All right, so, so as I mentioned, vet clinics is, on, is only being added in OSHED, pet services is being added in NC and PCC, pet hotel is being added in GC, PC, and CBD, PCC. In CBD, it is being added as a conditional use without outdoor use areas. You want one more? I have two more. Okay. Thank you. All right. So here's the first map. Uh, this map is for pet hotel and shelter establishments without outdoor use areas. In blue, you have where they would be permitted by right. In purple, you have um, allowed as a conditional use. And then yellow is just showing you the location in terms of distance from residential zoning districts. As mentioned, it is um, kennels and, and shelters are currently allowed in MIC and I. What is being added here is in LI, which is also an industrial area. It is being added in GC. PC and CBD and PCC. So this map is showing the separation requirements from residential uses to pet hotel and shelter establishments with outdoor use areas where allowed by the text amendment. That's on the next page if you have a copy. So this use is allowed as a conditional use and it is proposed to be allowed in GC, PC, MIC and I, it is currently allowed as a conditional use already, and in LI, it is being introduced. The code is proposing to allow those on th this use when 300, of, 300 feet is proposed between the establishment, the property, to residentially zoned properties. There's also a second layer of separation requirements being added, which is 50 feet from any abutting property to the outdoor use area. So in terms of OSHAD, we have vet clinics being added as a conditional use and we have pet services being added. Pet service, when it's only related to grooming, it is allowed um, as a, it is allowed by right as a principal use and when there's the, the daily boarding, it is being allowed as a conditional use. We also have um, additional specific requirements just for OSHAD being added, which they're on your screen. Um, in terms of the CBD, I have this slide just because the CBD is the heart of the city, so we have to be certainly careful with what is being changed or added to this area. So pet services are currently allowed and that will remain. Vet clinics are currently allowed as a principal, as a conditional use, and that is remaining. Uh, what is new is pet hotel and animal shelters. They're going to be allowed as a conditional use, without outdoor use areas. So, if anyone wanted to open a pet hotel, it could only be in the West Atlantic neighborhood uh, subdistrict <coughs> and in the railroad corridor subdistricts. Those are the only two areas that pet hotels would be allowed. Again, without outdoor use areas and it would be a conditional use. So again, it would come in front of planning and zoning and city commission for approval. Um, when there's a text amendment, there are certain findings that have to be met. It needs to be consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the comprehensive plan. The text amendment in front of you can be supported by policies and objectives in the neighborhood district and corridors element. Um, they pertain to 
a harmony with the adjacent uses and um, streamline the process and making the text amendment more and more cohesive with trends. It can also be supported by policies in the economic prosperity element, historic preservation element. And um, what I would like to report for you is that this text amendment has been in front of the Panepro Grove Main Street. It was presented to them on May 26, 2021. Um, the recommendation is part of your staff report. It was also presented to Historic Preservation Board on June 2, 2021, and their, rec their recommendation is part of your staff report. The only recommendation that you don't have in your staff report is from the DDA, which it was presented last week on Monday. Uh, they provide a recommendation of approval, and they made a motion to approve and recommended to increase the separation requirement from 300 feet to 600 feet citywide, and that separation requirement will be from residentially zoned properties to other properties with outdoor use areas. Once you're ready, um, I will have the motions on the, screen for, on the screen for you. There are three motions for tonight. One is approval, um, not approval, I'm sorry, recommend approval to the City Commission, recommend approval as amended, and denial to the City Commission. And I am ready to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Slasky. Before we move any further, um, can I ask Mr. Bennett, um, do we have public comment on this item? So it's not required. Right. Um, we haven't done it when we were remote because it required a five minute break. Right. Um, it's up to the board and, and really the chairman can can make this decision. But <clears throat> if we have people present that, that want to give a three minute or less statement, traditionally the chair or the board have granted that ability. I look to my colleagues. I mean, I have no objection to it. I, th I always like to get public input if we can. Um, is there anybody here in attendance this evening who would like to speak for three minutes on this item? Sure. <laughs> That's fine. If you could, if I could ask you a couple of questions. Um, has everybody, everybody who plans to speak this evening been sworn by our board secretary? If not, I would just ask that you get sworn um, now. Has everybody who plans to, has anybody who's here who plans to speak not been sworn? <laughs> Three people. Um, if you could please stand and be sworn by the board secretary. Thank you. Please raise your right hand by the authority best to name the notary of the state of Florida. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. Yes, sir. If you could please step to the uh, microphone and state your name and address for the record. Yes, good evening. My name is Matthew Scott. I'm a land use and zoning attorney with the law firm of Danae Miskell and Backman with an address of 14 Southeast 4th Street in the city of Boca Raton. I'm here on behalf of Barkingham Palace, uh, so I appreciate you letting us speak on this because I know there's a few of us that have waited, you know, to weigh in on all this. Um, I think the text amendment is great. My client has been providing... Um, pet hotel and grooming services for over 15 years in the city. Kind of came as a shock to them that on the city's record it's not technically, technically permitted. So um, part of the text amendment I think arose from some of the issues my client is having. And um, we're fully supportive of the text amendment. We think it makes a lot of sense. And I think Deborah did a great job with some of the details. The only thing that I would, um, there are kind of a couple comments I would have for you to consider, not sort of making a statement one way or the other is one, um, for pet boarding, pet hotel, um, I think that should be permitted as a, a permitted use, not conditional use, with no real limitations if it's done indoors in general commercial. I say that because up and down Federal Highway, that, that's a commercial corridor. And so while I understand there are some residences behind those businesses, it's very, very abundantly clear to people deciding to live on either side of Federal Highway that it's a commercial corridor. And so this is a very traditional commercial use. And if it's done entirely indoors, uh, we should, I think the city should allow businesses to do that. I think that the conditional use component, distance uh, separation requirements, things of that nature should be kept to the outdoor use because that's the thing that's going to have an impact. But something that's done entirely indoors in a commercial corridor, right, right where we want businesses to go, 
uh, that should be a permitted use. The other thing I would just ask you to consider is uh, the dumpster requirements. I think I understand uh, the city's uh, city staff's thinking with regard to wanting individual um, animal services to have their own dumpster. The issue is, uh, on, my, on my side of things, representing developers and business owners, it's kind of difficult sometimes to get your own dumpster in a shopping center. And so a lot of times these uh, grooming companies, pet boarding, small uh, vet offices, they're going into an existing shopping center that has a dumpster that they all share. So it's just something to think about because I'm not exactly sure it's as easy as just they got to get their own um, without getting a separate contract or something like that. And then the last item would be with regard to parking. Um, I did some research on this. The proposed parking for the various uses uh, is pretty consistent with a lot of cities in the area. The only thing I'd ask you to consider is just that um, with the pet hotel, the turnover there, what the experience my client has is cars are in and out really, really fast. They drop the dog off, or it's most likely a dog, and then they leave. And so having such a large parking requirement um, may be pretty difficult for a lot of business owners in, in the city, especially with um, how Delray Beach has a lot of areas that don't have a ton of parking. It's, it's constrained in a lot of areas. And so I just urge you to consider maybe reducing that requirement to something um, a little less onerous. I'm happy to answer any questions about my client's experience, but I'm here to support this text amendment, and I hope you guys do as well. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anybody else? <laughs> Mr. Quillian, back, back for three more minutes. Um, James Quillian, 925 Southeast 2nd Avenue. Um, just lucky that um, I was here for the uh, parking lot thing, and I happened to see this on the uh, agenda. To my surprise, uh, being that, you know, first of all, everybody knows who I am, and I'm the president of Homeowners Association. Whenever something directly affects the neighborhood, you would expect someone from the city to reach out to let me know, maybe try to work with the neighborhood, find out how they feel so things like this don't happen, and it's a complete surprise to me. And, like, I haven't even had a chance to talk to all, how, all the neighbors that this would affect. In the whole of Delray, I, I, don't, I don't want to be, like, a, a callous, but I try to concentrate on my neighborhood and what affects my neighborhood because it's a big city for me to concentrate on everything and how that affects everything. But for my neighborhood, this would negatively affect my neighborhood and the values of the homes that it's directly adjacent to. Um, an example would be uh, like 20 years ago, none of you were at fault, I hope, but they approved the same type of thing, conditional use for rub-a-dub car wash. So the car wash has been there for 20 years making money and doing good for the city tax-wise. But you think about the two blocks that are directly next to Rub-A-Dub that are permanently affected with the noise, you know, pressure cleaners all day long, with the jet engine blower, permanently affected the, the residents that live next to that uh, establishment. So what they're talking about doing here all along Federal Highway, directly adjacent to um, residential houses, on both sides, by, by the way, um, having direct proximity to a pet hotel. And the reason this is before you is because there happens to be about a year and a half ago, a pet hotel opened up in a metal warehouse building directly next to residential properties. You know, nothing like dogs barking at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning in a metal building and how that affects the property values and the residents <laughs> that live there. So when you consider these things, you know, if it was considered on a conditional use along residential areas, you know, that's more acceptable than to say, yeah, it's perfectly acceptable and okay along the residential areas of Osceola Park. I talked to the representative for uh, Del, uh, uh, Rio Del Rey Shores. He had no idea that this is going to possibly affect all his neighborhood, has no idea. And it was absolutely unhappy with the uh, idea that that might happen to his neighborhood also. I mean, so, you know, when you do these things, you know, why this is before you and how it could affect residents 20, 10, 30 years from now and the property values, you know, I think you have to be real careful about why this came before you and how this board might be used uh, to negatively impact a neighborhood such as mine. Thank you. We are not for this as a neighborhood, or at least I'm not for it. I haven't spoken to the neighbors because I just found out they're trying to do this tonight. Thank you, Mr. Quillian. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'd like to speak. Can My you name please? is, I'm sworn in. My name is Elizabeth McHugh. I live in Osceola Park. I'm about two blocks away from the pet hotel that James Quillian's talking about. I've been there all hours of the day and night. My dog goes there. 
it's spotless and you do not hear barking at two or three in the morning because I know the owner and I've been there and we've purposely videotaped and checked on this uh, business for that very purpose. So it is not negatively affecting the neighbors. In, we have so many first responders that bring their animals there and dogs that have been saved and brought there. This is not a deterrent to the neighborhood. Exact opposite. There are so many neighbors that bring their dogs there that have to be at work at all crazy hours or have to go away. Or like I said, the first responders, I bring my dog there. It's been a godsend. All these dogs are being socialized and well cared for. This building and the facility inside and out is spotless and is quiet. Occasionally you'll hear a dog bark and the minute the dog barks, the staff corrects them. I know I've been there at all hours because I knew this was gonna come up in this meeting. And I can't argue enough how important it is to keep that facility there. It is helping hundreds of people. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Could you please state your exact street address? You said it was two blocks away. 732 Southeast Third Avenue. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Hi, folks. I'm Dr. Jim Grubb, Mayfair Animal Hospital. I've been in Delray oh, since the early 80s, <laughs> quite a while. Um, my animal hospital, um, I don't think we ever had a complaint, you know, with the animals there, um, uh, with the neighbors. The Barton apartments were right next door to us, and that's fine. But what I'm concerned is that some of these things you can make retroactive to, to existing practices. And um, putting a standalone generator in that building is going to be extremely difficult for me. Um, and I think cost prohibitive. I don't think your building department's going to allow a, 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 a propane tank there, you know. Um, so I, I would really advise you to re reconsider this if you're going to do it to existing uh, businesses. And um, when the power is down, like when the hurricanes come, we're in the evacuation zone. We clear out. There's nobody's going to stay there. I mean, everything, everybody goes home. We don't board. Um, we only have, you know, a couple hospitalized cases at a time. But to put a standalone generator in, in, in for that is just um, ludicrous for us, you know. So I hope you're not making this retroactive. And these two other fine veterinarians, um, you know, Delray, most of the veterinarians are single man or two man practices. We're not these big corporations, except for Banfield. <laughs> and. <laughs> And, and, you know, we, we try to keep the prices good for our clients and, and do a good job. And uh, to put something like this on these practices, it, 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 it can be tough. And um, like these two don't even own their property. You know, they, they, they um, rent. And it would be difficult for them. So, thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, Diane. Yes, sir. Hey, guys. Uh, my name is Dr. Ben Carter, uh, Animal House Vet Center, 836 Southeast Fifth Avenue. So close to these guys over here. And uh, I'll echo everything that Dr. Grubb just mentioned. Uh, I do not own my land. I have a lease and to put in a Genrac um, generator that's going to turn on and, and satisfy all the requirements here uh, will cost me about $50,000. Um, if you put in the jet, the propane tank and all that good stuff, so um, uh, it's just definitely cost prohibitive to to us. And as far as emergencies and everything else like that are concerned, when the power goes out, well, fortunately our anesthetic machines function without uh, electricity. And I did house calls actually before I opened up my practice, and I was able to do a whole bunch of different stuff and provide emergency care and treatment uh, to the standard of care, which is outlined uh, by the state of Florida when we get our, our permits for our, uh, our facilities. Um, we don't need all these other things that, that may be proposed or, uh, you know, satisfies the language here. So it would be over and above what the state mandates and even the American Veterinary Medical Association uh, mandates for us to keep our doors open and provide a level of service 
um, that is, uh, you know, gold standard uh, as far as we're concerned. So I uh, definitely echo uh, what Dr. Grubb said. And I do think that uh, with the current language there, it would really be putting us at, a, as a, at a, an economical disadvantage, um, especially the practices that have already been set up. So thanks for your, uh, your understanding. Thank you. Spam. How are you? I'm Dr. Kristen Quisenberry with Dr. Q's Pet Vet. And along with my colleagues, we were all quite shocked to hear this of a potential new requirement, um, along with what they've said to, uh, to re require us to put in a Generac system in a leased property is just completely cost prohibitive. We, um, us small clinics, you know, we do um, after our emergencies or even during, during the day, if we have an emergency that we can't care for, we refer to our 24 hour hospitals, similar to human medicine. We're the small private practitioners and to require us to have a 24 or a, you know, a Generac generator is, is um, I just think above and beyond. I do have a generator that um, should need, uh, you know, but to have one that can maintain our, um, the um, x-ray machines and 100% and full service is not required when we have the ability to refer to our, our uh, local hospitals. Um, I think that's just my biggest complaint about the, uh, the use, the new use. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hi there. My name is Jennifer Roselli. I am the owner of Beach Dog that he was speaking about. Um, there is such a necessity for dog owners, and there's really no essential place to bring them besides um, Barkingham Palace. Um, I do take into consideration the noise level of the dogs. These dogs that come to Beach Dog are very well socialized. They are trained. We have two warehouses um, due to the fact that one of our neighbors, Mr. Gary Wolf, who's lovely, has decided to complain every time he hears a dog bark immediately that dog is brought in or they are turned away and for this matter of trying to keep my neighbors happy we stopped using the second warehouse to the west we're only boarding dogs to the east and when that steel door is shut you cannot hear a thing in the backyard period i have cameras that pick up noise and i constantly watching them these dogs are exhausted from playing all day and they are passed out come six o'clock I don't know if any of you bring your dogs to a doggy daycare, but they're exhausted. Um, as far as smell, we implemented a drainage system. Our waste is triple bagged. There's no smell. We have a, I created a petition to support Beach Dog when it was going to be taken down. We'll try to. We have over 10,000 signatures from our local residents and the community to keep Beach Dog. During COVID, um, we were a place to bring a dog's safely for first responders, for doctors, for nurses, for firefighters. They had no other outlet for their animals. And we were there to provide that. We also hire um, people with disabilities through ICAM. We also hire um, people in recovery. We also board dogs for people who are deployed. So the amount that we are giving back, and we also foster for local rescue groups. Um, those dogs that are a nuisance come home with me if there's ever an issue. I have no problem bringing a dog home with me. There's no, there was one instance where Mr. Wolf recorded a dog barking. I'm surprised why he hasn't recorded any other dogs barking if this is such an issue. No other neighbor has ever complained other than a habitual complainer who complains about every business that's around him, not just beach dog. So thank you for your time. Hope you take my big consideration. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, seeing that there, no one else wishes to speak on this item, uh, public comment is closed. And I will turn to my colleagues on the board for to hear any questions or comments they have on this item. Um, I, I guess I'll go first. I think this m maybe needs a little more work before we take action on it. And just looking at the public and courtesy notices, I noticed that it is it was noticed to the Delray Beach Chamber and the agenda was posted on Friday, June 11th. I don't know if that's enough. 
really considering the burden on some of these small business owners. Um, so I guess I would, I would just say my personal feeling is I, I think it needs a little more work. Um, well, let me just say um, in response to that, this is the first stop on this. Mm -hmm. And people can sign up to receive the agendas. It was posted 10 days in advance to this meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay, they can receive this. You can sign up at the city to receive emails on the meeting on every board. The agenda will be sent to you. Okay, so I think other than the fact that the public's notice met the requirement of law, that's what we're here to stand for. Second thing is, is that before this becomes a city ordinance, it's still going to go to the city commission. Right. It's still going to go to the city commission. So, um, I mean, my suggestion would be, um, rather than bring all these folks back again, okay, to hear their, <laughs> to voice their concerns, um, that we do take some action on this, and we can go home and publicize it and speak to people, because I'm sure it will be several weeks before it goes to the commission and people will have an opportunity to voice their concerns or designs on this um, before that body, certainly. Ms. Blankenship? To Ms. Howell's point, thank you for recognizing me. To Ms. Howell's point, um, I agree with her that uh, some more outreach, I mean, I'm not saying we should not take any action this right. evening, but before it gets to commission, um, some more outreach should be done. Uh, considering it's a broad change, um, that is going to be occurring, but it seems like there's a lot of residential involved and definitely needs some outreach to the DDA because CBD is involved in the downtown core um, and just kind of see, get the, the reaction or you know, see, get the feel of, of people's um, appetite for this. What concerns me um, is the use without an outdoor area. It seems like it's, we are adding in a, a wide swath of, of locations where that would be um, a, a permitted use um, right. by right. And so that concerns me um, for multiple reasons. Uh, if it's not coming back for, to a board or to the commission for a com conditional use process, you know, how are we mitigate? I'm sure it's, it will be instated clearly in the code, but how do they mitigate walking the animals, the waste of the animals, things of that nature? Those sure. would be my concerns, be mm -hmm. just because it's a wide um, ranging change that will be to the code. Uh, so, um, now that, that would be um, my first thought. Um, I also echo the Historic Preservation Board with changing the 300 foot to potentially 600 feet for residential. Um, um, yeah, it'd be interesting to hear what HPB had to say about that. Yeah, and so <laughs> those are just my comments um, at first look. Anybody else? Well, I do have a comment along with my colleagues. Uh, it would seem to me there's no more dedicated group of people than veterinarians and those who care for animals um, and any conditions that we impose that make it more difficult in an already difficult profession would be uh, out of line uh, particularly with respect to the, the generator um, this one only specific example but doesn't specify what type what size depend on the building. But I guess my comments fall under the heading of it's hard enough uh, for these dedicated professionals. Small been businesses. A serial Small business. uh, pet owner. Um, I, I agree with uh, Ms. Howe, Ms. Blankenship that further work does need to be done. Whether it's a denial here of, this, of the way it's written or um, some mechanism that allows for more research, for the areas specifically where it goes, where it would apply. As Ms. Blankenship said, it's, uh, it's pretty wild, wide. You see the purple. A lot of people in this city has pe pets. <laughs> it has a lot of pets, and, uh, uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, I also feel strongly that um, uh, it shouldn't, uh, we heard a lot of, uh, at the last commission meeting, a lot of talk about if it's not broke, don't fix it. Yeah, I don't think it should be retroactive to existing uh, uh, facilities. I think that would be onerous. As I said, it's, it's, it's hard enough, in my experience with um, all levels of veterinary care, uh, is that there is no, as I said, no more dedicated group of professionals 
um, uh, than uh, veterinarians and the people who work with and for veterinarians. I'm, I don't have any specific proposals, although I do agree that we need uh, further work on this ordinance. Thank you, Mr. Weinberg. Mr. Zeller. I have a lot of questions, a lot of comments, and a lot of concerns about this ordinance. I, th I think at this point it should be tabled um, for further study and review, but I have so many questions that w uh, Mr. Weinberg raised the one about, about, and one of the doctors raised the one about whether it's going to be uh, retroactive. I don't see how it can be made retroactive. These, these restrictions and the bulk requirements and the parking requirements and the, and the distance requirements are so onerous that probably none of, none of these businesses will be able to stay in business the way it is. Most of these businesses surround residential areas for the fact that people don't want to um, drive great distances to go see their veterinarian. When, <laughs> when we first got a dog about 20 years, 15 years ago, however long it was, my wife signed up for a veterinarian on Hagen's Ranch Road and Boynton Beach Boulevard, and we would have to drive way out there, and it caused so much concern and consternation uh, that we soon moved um, to veterinarians that are close by. We utilized the services of, of um, Barkingham Palace f uh, for many years. I don't know whether they had complaints or no complaints or whatever, but the parking requirements, it seems to me, of, of five spaces per thousand square feet is, is really uh, excessive. The parking requirements that you had for one space for 300 square feet for pet hotels or whatever that category was, who has 300 square feet of space? So let's, let's extrapolate that out. Uh, yep. That's also an excessive requirement. The bulk requirements, the bulk standards of setbacks to residential um, of 50 feet and building a six foot wall and whatever. What I would like to see on, on a further review is the existing facilities that are here in Delray, where they are, um, what position would be imposed by them if these standards as, as included in this were uh, provided to, uh, to their businesses. Um, the, the doctor, uh, I wrote his name down, but the first Mayfield. veterinarian that Martin. spoke, I know his, his facility, because we used it, was in the shopping center out on um, Military Trail in Atlantic. Am I correct? Is None of us. None of us. <laughs> <laughs> right. In We're any event, we used, that, we, used, we used that vet. It would be virtually impossible other than having the ability to meet the parking requirements for them to meet some of these setback requirements. And, and if they're in a shopping center like that, which that vet is, um, they would have to get permission from, from the shopping center itself. And for the dumpster, et cetera. No, I get what you're saying, Mr. Zeller. I heard all the comments from the majority of the board. So so. I'm, I'm I suggest that, that this go through further study. It may be, but I think also one of the key elements has to be that, that, it can, that these businesses have to be recognized as pre-existing uses that were approved prior to this ordinance and that these, the terms of these were, and, and I'm presupposing that, that these businesses had the proper authority to open their doors to begin with. I right. assume that all the veterinarians had the proper authority because they're governed by the county, they're governed by the state, they're governed by the veterinarian society, I, I suppose, as well. But the other businesses, um, you know, the doggy daycare centers or um, 
animal shelters, I don't even know, you know where they are, but I think we should do an analysis of where they're located and what the impacts would be. But it should, you really, you really need to consider whether the retroactive effect against them, even with regard to sure. a generator, providing a generator, which I think makes sense to have, but how that would impact on your existing businesses, because you're gonna lose a lot of businesses, and then you're gonna have a lot of people with pets that are gonna be very unhappy that they have to drive out to Hagen's Ranch Road and Boynton Beach Boulevard <laughs> board their, to board their animal. It used to take me a half hour or more to get there. You got it, Mr. Zeller. Hang on one sec. Um, Ms. Morrison, before you speak, I know Ms. Alvarez wishes to say something, please. I, only, I just wanted to start addressing comments as they've come up. I've taken notes, but I just don't want to forget anything. That's my issue lately with getting nope. older. Um, just regarding the retroactive, um, it's only the generator, and maybe that's something we can, that has some, that was something that we also did for pharmacies when we did an LDR amendment 15 sure. years ago or so. But um, you know, maybe that's something that we can look at that when they come through the conditional use process, we don't say, you know, you have to have the generator, but maybe you give us your hurricane emergency plan as part of the review. Just, you know, the whole intent was, of all of this, I, I hope everybody knows, was, um, you know, protecting the neighborhoods from um, any nuisances and noises, and but also trying no, to support the businesses as well. It's no different from what the right. city does with <laughs> bars and other businesses. Right, right. We did a <laughs> lot of research. Um, we're not trying to make anything too onerous for anybody. Um, I just, I just want everybody to understand that we're we're really trying to be sensitive. Um, just regarding the parking requirement, that is the current requirement in the code. Um, it's not specified for vet clinics. So we use the medical office parking requirement. So that's where that came from. But we can look and see what adjustments we can make. Um, but the medical, if I may, the medical requirements are for, that have a higher parking requirement are reasonable because you make your doctor's appointment and you're there for however long. And then the next person comes uh, little early so for every patient you mm -hmm. really have to plan on having two cars so right. there's Mr. that Zeller, of parking. Mr. Room. Zeller I want to interrupt you there. So, I used to own medical practices. Hmm? That's not the way it works. <laughs> okay. and, you know and then, and then the doctors schedule four patients an hour however they do it it's it's a heavy parking requirement. For a lot of these businesses it may be five minutes or less that they spend there. They drop their dog off or they pick it up. It's not like a child daycare center where the parent has to go in, check in, mm -hmm. drop, take, you know, to take their child to the classroom, uh, get the child settled, and then come out. So that may take them 15 or 20 minutes. So that may need a higher parking mm -hmm. demand than, okay. than some of these businesses. And I think that we have to be a little realistic when we impose these new requirements. I'm not saying that, mm -hmm. that the concerns are not legitimate concerns that are included in, in proposed ordinance, but I think that it should be a study of where are the businesses are that we now have, what, how this would impact them and well, it would only impact them with the generator, or if if it, if you had a and I'm, I'm, my apologies for interrupting you, but I just wanted to let you know. Um, so if you currently have just pet services and you're you don't have any um, boarding, right? If you were going to expand and include boarding, then that that might be where. And and I'd be, be an curious impact. to see in in that evaluation whether most of the businesses are say non-corporate type businesses. Um, PetSmart is a big corporation. You tell them to put in a, a big generator, they can put in a big generator, they can afford it. Some of these um, veterinarians are, are one doctor offices, maybe two doctor offices and, mm -hmm. and um, the impact on them 
would be would be significant, of course, and the impact on some of the other pet service, what what you're calling it, mm -hmm. pet service businesses as well. So I think that should be looked at as to see who we're really affecting or we affect affecting what would commonly be known as mom and pop operators or are we affecting the big corporate entities? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Zeller. Um, before you start, Ms. Morrison, you're the person who hasn't spoken on this issue. Did you want to speak on anything? Is that okay with you, Jennifer? Me? I was in the middle of... Oh, I know, but I mean, I want to let all the oh, board no, members speak and then let Jennifer. She said she was writing down what, what our comments but were. I'm going by Amy. Amy, today. sorry, sorry. I'm Amy, so Amy so Ms. Alvarez. That's okay. <laughs> so, uh, no worries. <laughs> so, like, I saw. Oh, I'm definitely not Jennifer Alvarez. <laughs> no, that's what I was looking at. Sorry, Amy. <laughs> no coffee. <laughs> yeah, really. You have to give us more chocolate. Yeah, really. <laughs> no, that's Diane. That's Diane. That's Diane. <laughs> um, I can't support this the way it's written. I'm so sorry, but um, I just want to put in my two cents about the generators. If neighbors are complaining about dogs barking, wait till they have the noise of a generator going day after day during the storm. <laughs> they will go bonkers. The size of beach dogs would need such a large generator that the whole neighborhood would be disturbed by the loud noise. So there's got to be other ways that that these situations can be handled. I also have severe uh, trepidation about a pet hotel in, a, in the CBD at all, uh, any kind. Um, if you look at the map, the lots are very, very small. Um, I just don't know where you would be able to put it that it wouldn't have negative impact on that neighborhood. I'm very concerned with noise. I think DDA's idea about the 600 feet um, from a residential property is a good idea for, for noise reasons. Mr. Zeller brought up a point about a Walmart putting in a generator. Well, Walmart's surrounded by 5,000 parking spaces, and it's in the middle. In the middle, it's like an island in the middle of a parking lot. Um, these residential neighborhoods are not like that. So I, I just have severe trepidation. We just wanted the puppies taken care of when the lights go out no, during I'm a hurricane. <laughs> so we do too. No. I know. I know. I can, that's, I can, that's where they came from. No, I just want to say that. Um, you know, as far as the generator requirements go, from my perspective, that should be more something affiliated with pet hotels. Um, because when somebody drops off their dog at the facility for two weeks and it's during the hurricane season and they're going to Africa or Europe, you're not going to call them up and be like, I need you here. We're shutting down. The hurricane's coming. Um, so I think that it prob I agree with my colleagues. We should take a longer and harder look at this. And um, what I would suggest if someone wants to make a motion would be um, potentially, uh, Ms. Alvarez, I would ask you, would you like us to postpone this to a date certain of August maybe? Well, it's, it's not a public hearing. Okay. Um, so it wasn't advertised. So you don't have to postpone to date certain. Okay. Um, we no, know but I do mean also just so the people know when it's coming back up. The people are here tonight, right. have no doubt. Um, we know that um, this is um, something that's important to commission, and as soon as they mentioned it at their meeting and their comments, we moved it to the top of our list. Okay. Um, then let's so do it in July. We will, we will hope for July. Um, okay. Or August. I know that we do have the emails of many of the uh, pet, I'm sorry, pets, domestic animal service people here. Sure. <laughs> sorry, the professionals. Um, we do have Mr. Quillian's email address. Uh, we don't typically send out an email to all HOAs throughout the entire city with every LDR amendment that we do, but we, knowing that he is interested, we can certainly. Sure. And it was um, posted on the agenda. Send which... it to him as well. Right. right. I think it ought to be sent out to HOAs that are, <clears throat> excuse me, affected by it. Not every HOA, but uh, those that are affected, because it's a balance between having these facilities that are neighborhood-oriented, accessible to the neighborhood, and yet protecting from any nuisance factor. So personally, I think it ought to be sent out to them, and, and I'd also love to see some sort of affirmative outreach to all the vets, pet hotel owners, anybody we can find, um, to, to let them know a little bit more about this. I mean, uh, we appreciate all your dedication. Maybe like the Alliance of Delray. 
perhaps yeah. they could reach out to the HOAs and maybe the chamber could help get the businesses kind of. That's a good idea. Know. Yeah. Sure, we do always send these to them. Um, you get the idea. Just, just to note regarding yes. HOAs, we don't have all of their contact. I know you don't. Yeah. Just so you know, in case somebody says, hey, you missed me. You know, there is an alliance of HOAs. Yeah, um, that's what. That's what that, Julian was speaking about. Yeah. yeah. So at least that's a good place to start. Yeah. Just those that I guess would be impacted, which Mr. I'm not Chairman, I have one question. On. So with regards to the comment that was made about us contacting certain HOAs, I have some concerns with that because it would be up to staff to determine which ones are being are being affected or not, and that could create some. Um, Here's what I would suggest. These can go into a large portion of the city. The HOAs for which you have or the condominium associations for which you have contact information, just send it out to them. Okay, so anybody else? If the they haven't taken the have, time to register, it's not our okay. obligation to track uh, them down. Yes. It, it, do we have an like an email blast system that people have signed up for, correct? Right. We do. So, That's what I mean. I mean I, th I think if anything we should just utilize that system. You know, one thing I'm concerned about is if we start doing this now and then don't do it in the future, they're sure. going to claim that we've somehow right. set a precedent. Right, violated an obligation we put on ourselves. Sure. Um, certainly, uh, the word will get out, and staff can use just the the blast system of everybody that's voluntarily signed up to be updated about that's, the city. That's what I suggested. Which the city has a list, blast it out to that list, and just encourage. We would ask you to speak to people who are your colleagues in the area and make them aware of this too. If I might make a suggestion. Okay, so this ordinance is impacting what we're calling the broad definition domestic animal services, which includes your vet clinics, pet services, and hotels and animal shelters. I do have a list of all um, registered and allowed uses included within that broad definition. Sure. Um, if the board gives me direction and the city attorney tells me it's okay to do so, I can send a, a blast email, blast mail to them. It is not, no more than 10 or 12 contacts. I would, yeah, I would defer to Mr. Well, on that. It sounds like no there's objection. a consensus from the board, so we can meet outside of the meeting and okay. talk about that. Yep. Great. So, um, the plan is we'll take this back up in July or August, and um, September and October we'll deal with farm animals, correct? <laughs> <laughs> so you need a motion? Fingers on the button. Excuse me one moment. Mr. Weinberg had a question. Well, I just have a question of staff. Uh, um, certain of the infrastructure improvements, you know, as, you, as, as it has been discussed, you go from a very, very small facility with maybe one physician and assistant and a few air, you know, very small to you know, PetSmart that basically uh, is a completely different type of operations. Maybe the, the infrastructure improvements that are going, when this finally does uh, become uh, 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 complete, and we've done this before, I think, limited by size. So if you're up to 5,000 square feet, you have to do something. If you're a 15,000 square foot facility, it's another set of conditions. Because usually the smaller facilities, at least in my experience and my wife's experience, are um, don't have a lot of staff, don't have a lot of space. Uh, and it is as much a labor of love as it is a uh, sometimes more of a labor of love than it is a, a profit-making uh, venture. So to treat them all the same, maybe that's a consideration staff could could uh, incorporate. We can certainly look into that. Uh, just to further um, elaborate on Ms. Alvarez's comments, uh, the only condition in front of you that is retroactive is the generator. Um, when you have a VAC clinic, and that was the majority of the comments. When you have a vet clinic, it does come in front of you 
for the conditional use and then it goes to city commission for future vet clinics we would not be adding an additional step if they couldn't comply with that requirement it would be part of their proposal that this is my emergency plan i do not have the means to provide a full generator right now so please evaluate my conditional use with this emergency plan and then that request will be carried over with the conditional use regardless of, regardless of the size or the operations that would be presented in front of you um, now with the existing ones they would have to provide a, a, a a new petition just for the waiver to go in front of city commission so that can be adjusted that it is not retroactive um let's see the, the parking requirements miss amy miss amy already, already touched on that uh let's see if there's anything else Separation. the language for the emergency plan in the ordinance itself or is that something that's just it's just requiring the generator okay and so then it make, has make the sure to add that specific language in the ordinance about them okay or or emergency plan okay uh, can, can you? i would encourage my colleagues let's if since we're going to definitely be hearing this in the future let's kind of move on um keep moving along with our agenda but what i would just say is that i would urge my colleagues things may dawn on you on the way home or tomorrow or the next couple of days on this um if you have thoughts on this subject please email ms alvarez or ms slasky um, and let them know your thoughts in advance of the next meeting. So I think that's a good way to handle it. Okay. Do we need a motion to table or how well, are we going to do it? Well, if some of the Ford dealers want to donate the new Ford Generate. 150, which can power your house for 15 <laughs> hours, electric vehicle, that might I've take seen those. Very nice. Minor left. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Mr. Bennett, um, let me just ask you, do we need a motion to table? Please, just a motion to postpone. That simple. Postpone. It doesn't postpone. need to be a date certain. I think Ms. Alvarez said earlier it's not a public meeting. I think what she meant there's no heightened notices. Sure. No, obviously, a public meeting. But I'll, you, I'll make a motion to uh, postpone until july or august well, let's say no date certain to no date certain okay of city commission ordinance number 17-21 to amend the land development regulations to adopt specific regulations for domestic animal services and to identify those zoning districts where domestic animal services are allowed as a principal or conditional use by finding that the amendment and approval thereof is consistent with the comprehensive plan <laughs> And meets the criteria. Much. Just postpone. That's Just motion much. to postpone. <laughs> okay, okay. Good. Good. All right, motions. we got that. Exactly. I second Great. your motion to postpone. That's a motion <laughs> by uh, Ms. Howell and a second by Ms. Blankenship, Diane. And whenever you're ready, please call the roll. Joy Howell? Yes. Alan Zeller? Yes. Julian Blankenship? Yes. Rick Swinberg? Uh, yes. Jane Morrison? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, Ms. Alvarez, Ms. Slasky, and the members of the community who came and spoke. Thank you. And with that, we're going to move on to the last item. Ms. Alvarez. I'm squinting. You just wanted to stay with us to the last possible minute, right? Oh, I'm required. <laughs> <laughs> I think my, my coworkers were making fun of me one time. No, during our during our virtual meetings, I said something like, I need my job. I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> I think it was actually Deb that was making fun of me. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm here. Um, all right, so this is an LDR amendment, Ordinance 2521, and this is sponsorship of privately initiated LDR amendments. It's something I hope you can appreciate. Yes, I can. Uh, <laughs> so in March, the commission adopted new local rules of procedure. And within those local rules, it noted that um, workshops could be utilized to consider sponsorship of privately initiated amendments to city LDRs, and that the, but that the requirement would not take effect until the LDRs were amended. So our current process with privately initiated uh, amendments to our regulations in, Ultimately, commission really isn't aware of many of them until we've done a lot of work on them and they're included on an advisory board and meeting agenda. We've spent a lot of time, uh, research and review on them, which we actually enjoy. <laughs> we, love, we love that part of it. But frequently, the application fee isn't really proportionate to the amount of time that we spend 
reviewing, uh, especially with some requests that um, represent a more significant impact or concern um, and deviate from city policies. So um, the proposed language <laughs> is um, a member of the public would uh, request that the LDRs be amended. It, they would be required to get a sponsor by at least one member of the city commission prior to submitting the act, actual application for review by staff. And so they would have additional requirements. So um, as I mentioned, at least one member of commission would uh, need to sponsor it. When um, at the meeting in March at commission, they did discuss, should it be only one? Should it be two? And they ultimately said, well, we'll stick with one and see how I it guess kind of see how it goes. Right. So that's what we're moving forward with. Um, applications. So you would go to a workshop. You get a sponsor. You then have 90 days to submit that application. Your sponsorship isn't going to be valid. <laughs> At least that's how we're proposing it. It's not going to be valid forever. Um, and then we're also specifying that your request must be identical. <laughs> What you submit to us must be identical to what the city commission discussed and understood and it cannot deviate, uh, can't increase the density or intensity or anything else um, that were not discussed or understood during that workshop. Um, so we've got required information that'll have to be submitted. And then we made an additional amendment here under C. You know, right now the LDRs say, you need to provide an analysis of the amendment and its potential impacts. But what about its benefits? So um, we thought that was something important to highlight because many people do not do that. So findings with LDR amendments, we know it has to be consistent with the comprehensive plan and we have an, um, uh, an objective in the Always Delray comp plan about reviewing and updating the LDRs regularly. This is tentatively scheduled for commission for a meeting in July and then again in August for adoption assuming that you provide a recommendation to a city commission. Perfect. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Alvarez. Thank you. Mr. Zeller. Yes, I have a few comments. Great. I am all in favor of this ordinance. I think it's, I, I think it's necessary. I think it's required. We have to deal far too often with these privately initiated uh, changes to the ordinances, to to the um, well, to the LDRs, to the zoning requirements, whatever. So mm -hmm. I think that it's an excellent um, proposal. Um, I'd like to suggest consideration of the board consider two things instead of having one commissioner uh, support it, that there be uh, at least two commissioners that support it. And I think that the other concern is that since, as you note in here, that apparently the application fee that the applicant has to submit, I don't know how much it is, it might be rather nominal, but I think that the applicant should literally pay the uh, cost of the fees for the staff to do the full review that they're obligated to do. And whether that's done by increasing that application fee to a commensurate amount of, of time or keeping track of the time like a lawyer would do and bill for the services uh, as it goes along and have the applicant uh, establish an escrow that, that can be turned over and the um, only other addition that I would like to make, and it's um, somewhat tongue in cheek, but while the commissioners are recognizing their right to have workshops to consider these things, I think it should be recognized that the Planning and Zoning Board also has a right, as Mr. Weinberg suggested about a year ago, uh, that we have workshops as well upon occasion when we feel the need is necessary. So with, with that, I 
think I think this is an important uh, step forward um, in in addressing the issues of these privately initiated changes to our ordinances, comp plan, zoning plan, uh, what have you. Thank you. Thank you. If I can just, the application fee, I did look it up right before the meeting. Um, it's $5,500. And they, um, so that's the application fee. And then the applicant also pays advertising costs. So, um, you know, if it's something that requires a mailer <laughs> or, or it, some sentinel ad. They should be re the so. staff should be reimbursed, or the city <laughs> really should be reimbursed for the uh, added expense that that staff is incurring for taking this additional step of changing literally what has already been uh, adopted by the commissioners as the ordinances and and uh, comp plan and and the, the zoning plan that the city has adopted already. And if they want to change it, then they should have to really support it. And I think that other addition that you made is th that they have to provide justification going forward as well. I mean, if somebody wants to increase, like we had, the height of a building from from four stories to six stories and from 30 density units per acre to 80 density units per acre, then, you know, that to me is, is significant. And the, the, the commissioner should take a look at it and say, okay, going in, we'll, we have this at least two people supporting it mm -hmm. and then have the analysis done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Zeller. Who's next? Anybody? I just have a question. Sure. Did Ms. Alvarez say that the commissioners had discussed whether they should have one or two? Yes, they did. Yes, they and did. And they determined one? Yes. At that meeting? One and see how it goes. Okay. They, they were considering increasing, but they wanted to start it. I mean, if you think about it, they're kind of using uh, the, the methodology we use in Congress and we use in the state of Florida. You know, you find one rep, yeah, they can right. sponsor you. <laughs> right, they can carry the bill or you know, whatever. Up in, up in Tallahassee, they don't require to. So okay, um, well, I'm I'm in support of this. So yes, okay. just one um, comment. Just one comment. Um, I agree with Mr. Zeller. His position that uh, maybe two commissioners as a sponsorship would be a good idea, only because, and I'm not saying this would ever happen. There could be some sort of sense of impropriety in a small city environment when you have people that um, come to you for a privately initiated amendment. You're speaking to one commissioner without somebody else being involved. There could be um, an appearance that potentially there could be some impropriety going on. I'm not saying that would ever occur. I'm just saying that it's a possibility or people might think that. So um, by having at least two commissioners sponsor it, you would kind of um, negate that possibility. But that's just my view. Um, and I'm at the pleasure of the board. And <laughs> yeah, I guess, um, let me ask Danny, uh, Ms. Morrison or Mr. Weinberg wished to weigh on this before I share my thoughts. Sure. Um, having two commissioners involved may uh, somehow violate sunshine laws, Mr. Benneken. Said sh shed some light on that. Um, there should be some kind of guidelines about how often the workshops would happen. Are they going to be annually, the quarterly, whatever, to try to cut down on this work proposed workload? Um, and I would definitely question that fee, Amy, $5,500. I know how hard you guys work. We actually just increased it. I know you did. <laughs> 5000 before. I know, because I paid it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that, but still, that seems a little low when you consider all the work that goes into one of these mm -hmm. changes. Um, Boca does have this, um, mm -hmm. and it seems to be working. So, uh, if there is concerns that um, the, there's things going on that city commissioner is aware of, then I think this would be a good start to um, stop that. Mic down. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Weinberg. Yeah, nothing? Nothing. Nothing? Okay. Um, I will say this. Anything that makes it more streamlined, 
in according with NDC 3.5 it is, and makes it more reasonable for staff to do the work that they have to do. The, wor the workload is incredible, and it's particularly in the last uh, eight months of this frenzy of um, the real estate market down here, as Mr. Chairman, you know, <laughs> it's just uh, the volume of work uh, is, is uh, it's not lessening. <laughs> I think that makes it easier to, 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 for them to do their jobs in an eight hour day, I think is a, is a good thing. I agree with you completely. I mean, listen, they're in the business where the tide always comes in. It doesn't go out. <laughs> mm. you know? um, so, yes, I want to say that um, I agree with my colleagues in thinking that in some way, I mean, two members may work better than one, but the, the commission asked for it in one. They're the ones who are going to have to deal with it. And one rep in Tallahassee, it takes to sponsor a bill. So um, as Ms. Morrison said, the process seems to be working in Boca Raton. And uh, the city commission said, let's try it here. And if uh, we have to tweak it down the road, we will. Seems perfectly reasonable to me. So I'd look for a motion from one of my colleagues on this. Sure, please. Please, of course. Ms. Alvarez, do you have any idea or can estimate any way um, how many man hours that the Building Services Department spends on a privately initiated amendment? It, it really depends, just as, uh, the example that Mr. Zeller kind of referred to. Um, that one was a lot. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a lot. It, it really just depends on how much, you know, we think the impact is and how much concern we have. And if it is a significant deviation, so we have to really review what was the basis of the current regulation and we go back into old codes to try to just get the footprint for our, or the whatever mm -hmm. the history the background well well it's also the attorney's office too <laughs> sorry it's not just about us it's we yeah <laughs> maybe i mean i'm not trying to give you more work on top of everything <laughs> like maybe to see kind of what boca does like what they charge us neighboring cities because if we're really low right. on the scale of what another city would charge then we do typically when we did our fee research last summer to increase our fees last fall we we did look at them mm -hmm. um i don't recall what they were I, I think we did we did somewhere between five and ten percent depending on what the item was but we will look at that again for yeah, sure please please look at it Amy. thank you and so I much can, and then you know it's it's also if you really feel strongly about your ldr amendment you've got a fee of fifty five hundred dollars <laughs> no, i mean well, you know so. I, I can just say that 15 years ago when i left new jersey um because i went back and looked at it uh the town where I lived in New Jersey required a um, $7,500 deposit to be made by the city. And then they had a breakdown for the city attorney, planner, um, et cetera, fire, Engi safety. Engineer, all the traffic consultant, all those, right. all those professional That's fees. That's the way they did it where and, I was in New Jersey. And, and literally, you got a bill every month. And literally, literally, in. In my view, and as excuse me, as Chris is, uh, um, Davy is saying, the city is there to protect the interests of the city. The applicant is going to have their lawyer, they're going to have their planner, they're going to have their engineer, they're going to have their traffic consultant, and then they throw it in the lap of of the department, and you're. You have to, if it's complicated, you have to start scrambling around. So it seems to me that if, in fact, they want it really on almost any application, that if you need to have to call in an outside consultant, say for, uh, say for traffic, or you need to call in an outside consultant for, say, a structural engineer, that's mm -hmm. that's not on staff. That that the applicant should be the one paying for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that it, that's consistent with um, the way development occurs in, in many areas and in many other places. I mean, Amy, you know, 
Some files are quick and others are not so quick. Oh, baby. <laughs> I, I still have a little one that's on hold since last August. The restaurant go. bar hybrid. <laughs> Yep. Oh, that's well, right. it didn't even make it past first reading. <laughs> but well, it's on hold. I think we're all in favor of giving you guys this more streamlined process, mm -hmm. and also, hopefully, this is going to work to lessen the workload on the commissioners too. Mm -hmm. So, um, with that being said, can I just address something really quick that uh, uh, Ms. Morrison said? Um, they can schedule for any city commission workshop, and they hold those monthly. Monthly workshops? Yeah. Okay. Whenever the commission has it, but they do. I think there's might be one or two months out of the year that they don't have one, but okay. yeah. Because I, I don't want to get on my soapbox, but um, we, we're not working with 50-year-old LBRs here. We've updated our comp plan. We're, we're up to date on everything. Well, a lot of them are 31 years old, yeah, but, but, but we're, <laughs> we're trying. <laughs> a lot of the LBRs are updated, and yeah. we just have a new comp plan, and you know, mm -hmm. when somebody wants to come in and make a change, they should pay for that. You know, mm -hmm. they should cover all of your expenses. Yeah. yeah. We, and expenses. we appreciate that. <laughs> That's my <laughs> Okay. Perfect. Yep. All Perfect. good. You got it. So, motion? Make a motion. Please. Recommend approval to the City Commission of Ordinance Number 25 21, amending the land development regulations to amend. The Land Development Regulation is requiring that at least one member of the City Commission shall sponsor a privately initiated amendment to the LDRs at a City Commission workshop prior to the submittal of an application for such a request by finding that the amendment and approval thereof is consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets the criteria set forth in Land Development Regulation. Great. Second. Second. Second by Ms. Morrison. Diane, whenever you get a chance, please call the roll. Joy Howell. Yes. Helen Zeller. Yes. Yes. Mike Swineberg? Yes. Christina Morrison? Yes. Christine? Yes. Okay. We're now on to my favorite three items of the evening. <laughs> the three. 10A. <laughs> the Amy, three the floor is yours. Ones. All right. Next meeting, July 19th. We're still in person. Knock on wood. Nothing happens there. Um, I lost my agenda. All right, I just wanted to give you an update. The lead ordinance that you saw at your meeting in May, we're anticipating that going for first reading at the July 6th City Commission meeting, and then it'll go in August, hopefully, for job, for adoption. So we'll, we'll see. The Sustainability Office has taken that over to move it through the City Commission um, review and approval process. Um, and then we're, we've also been busy working on resurrecting um, the CBD expansion um, south south of Southeast 4th Street, so from Southeast 4th Street down to Southeast 10th Street, Southeast 5th Avenue, and Southeast 6th Avenue, that okay. whole area. It's something that we started in 2018. It went, it came to Planning and Zoning Board in October of um, 2019 and then had first reading right before COVID. So we're resurrecting it with a first reading hopefully in July. And um, I think Max will be happy. <laughs> it's, it's expanding CBD, so we're we're um, implementing the comp plan policy about form-based code. <laughs> um, so it's it's been an effort we've been working on for quite a long time, and hopefully it goes somewhere. <laughs> um, but that was that was all my updates. Perfect. Thank you, Ms. Alvarez. Mr. Bennett. Two quick things. Um, one, just a little bit of guidance. We were talking about the imposition of conditions and how it relates to a site plan. And so if this board had been interested, you know, it would have helped um, maybe shape the motion. But keep in mind that even if it's something that would be a final site plan approval, the board can give some type of direction on that through a, a condition. So for example, if you had a parking lot surrounded by residential and you knew there was going to be evening business in that parking lot, you could do a condition that the wall block 90% of headlights or, you know, that includes sound dampening material or something like that that doesn't hamper SPRAB into picking a specific material or a specific height, but imposes a condition that requires um, the applicant to comply with an extra hurdle um, through the site plan approval process. 
So um, you guys didn't go that direction tonight, so I didn't need to jump in, but I know you're sometimes frustrated with the site plan and the conditional use being separate. But you guys can still have a little bit of wiggle room, and I can help you with that. You know, if if there is those types of conditions that you feel are important to be attached to conditional use. Um, the second thing is just welcome back to in person. It's good to see everybody um, in the flesh again. Uh, it was good to see everybody we were expecting, and just want to say hello to Alice. It's good to see you again. <laughs> so, um, but that's it from our office. I, I forgot Thank you, Alice Bennett. was here. Should we have? had public comment during the sponsorship item. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Alice. <laughs> At any rate, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Bennett. Thank you, Ms. Alvarez. I turn to my colleagues on the board. Does anybody have anything to say for our first time back in uh, one year plus? Well, I have a couple of comments. Go ahead. So in furtherance of what Mr. Bennett uh, just indicated with regard to the um, um, bifurcation of the structure of the spray board and the planning and zoning board. I think, I think there should be some serious consideration given to consolidating the boards. I've done some research. There are not many cities in the state of Florida that have a dual process. I don't know how long Delray has had it, but I think it's time to at least revisit it because it gets very frustrating. We can all see the frustration even on the part of the developers. Um, well, I don't know how we would raise that. I suppose it has to be raised to the commissioners, um, but... We can reach out for the commissioners. I mean, each of us could, knows people up there on the day, uh, so... If we could consider that and then also revisit um, that issue of the workshop, which I brought up or <laughs> which I brought up earlier, and this would be a perfect topic to discuss at a workshop whether we would want to consider um, suggesting to the commissioners to consolidate the uh, boards in some fam form or fashion. The other thing I think uh, that we had once considered and might I suggest to perhaps reconsider uh, was starting the meetings earlier. I know that we chose not to do that because at least one of the members said that they you know, had working obligations at least till five o'clock. I, I, I don't know whether that's still pertinent or not, but um, just to prevent meetings from because we have such a full agenda from ending at 10, 11 o'clock at night, it gets, it gets onerous. It'll be better now that we're in person because it goes faster than it does when we were doing the Zoom stuff and having to take a break, you know, for comments and whatever. The other items that I would like to mention is that um, also, um, as was commented upon by, um, by Gail Clark when she spoke during public session, I think we need to do something about imposing a tree moratorium. I think it was a um, unfortunate circumstance that happened uh, with the uh, Sunday Village development I know that, that there was a lot of controversy over that and, and, and you know, the, the developer was alleging that it was a city staff that said it was, it was appropriate to, to uh, take out trees. Um, in my view, I think that that is just a red herring these developers know what their obligations are. They have their lawyers. They have their planners. They should, they either know or should know. And to try and throw it back at the staff that that the staff allowed it, whether they did or they didn't allow it, intentionally or unintentionally, uh, I think that raised the issue of the tree moratorium. And again, I did some 
research into that, and I didn't find many uh, towns in Florida that had had a lot to do with um, tree tree ordinances or tree protections, but I think there should be. Winter Park, for one, has a formal tree advisory board, which gives recommendations to the city commission related to the protection and improvement of the city's trees and the goal of, of fostering and maintaining and improving the public stewardship, protecting long-range planning and, and careful oversight and implementation of improvement projects for the maintenance, preservation, growth, and enhancement of trees within the city. I think, I think it's critical given what um, has happened, what Ms. Howell mentioned earlier um, with, with trees disappearing for whatever reason. I think it was Ms. Howell that mentioned it. No, it was. Mr. So, Zeller, I would just suggest what you're speaking about, I, su I support. Sure, other cities have shade tree commissions and other things like that, but we don't have the ability to do that. The answer to what you're saying is speak to the commissioners. Why don't we have the ability? We're an advisory board. I realize we're an advisory board, but could we not have a motion that, that we would recommend that the city commission look at a more comprehensive um, tree preservation solution. I mean, we are the Planning and Zoning Commission. Mm -hmm. We do have uh, several items in our comprehensive plan that speak to conservation, sustainability, and resiliency. Um, a number of them, CSR 1, CSR 8.4, 8.4 1 and 2, they all speak to the tree, to a tree canopy, to sustainability, to all of that. Couldn't we, uh, in our advisory capacity, and agreeing with what Mr. Zeller said, couldn't we say that our feeling is that we need a more, more comprehensive look at tree protection for the city and sustainability and recommend to the commission to take a look at it? I mean... No, unfortunately, they don't really, they don't get involved in controversy in and... Issues. Um, At any rate, what I would suggest, Ms. Hal, is... Um, you know, I think there should be some dialogue, let's say, between mm -hmm. the advisory board and the commission, mm -hmm. okay? Um, I would want to get an answer maybe from Mr. Bennett, Ms. Gellin, about is that something we would have the ability to do? Well, it's certainly something we can take a look at. Um, and you can tell us at the next meeting? Yeah, so I think we should be able to obtain an answer by then, yeah. That'd be great. Okay. Um, because I'll, if I'll we get can make, on this well, here's, here's my attitude on it. If we can make something, uh, recommendations on things that come before us, it might even be on other items, tangential items that dawn on us, and a majority of the board feels a certain way, I have no problem communicating that to the city commission. Now, in what manner they should take, whether it's a memorialized resolution that, you know, Planning and Zoning Board voted, you know, whatever it was, 6-1, you know, whatever the breakdown is, they would like, they feel the city should take into effect a, some sort of tree ordinance or Creating a tree board advisory or board, or like certain towns <laughs> yeah. shade tree commissions, right? something like that. But what I'm going to tell you is, is that we're not directing the city commission, obviously, no, of to course do anything. Not. No. These would just be... Just like I think Sprab should have that right on certain items if they wanted to communicate it. Well, hasn't the Green Board done that? They brought things to commission. Probably, yeah. Is that I mean, haven't they, Ms. Melissa? The commission, commission looks to their advisory boards in, in some ways for advice on things. Right. Well, what I would say is I have no problem issuing, I mean, we do it every night. This is, you know, the board breakdown was unanimous in this regard. Mm -hmm. um, and I think giving that opinion, that's all it is, an opinion, a suggestion. The commission I don't have a problem with, but I obviously, you know, there's, when the city created the Planning and Zoning Board, there was probably some language, okay, that's, that, uh, let's just say, um, devised how this board should work and what its role is. And what I would maybe ask Mr. Bennett, if you could, 
when this was created, um, the responsibilities of the board, if you could just send that to all the board members, that'd be great. And then we can take it up at the next meeting and discuss it. On the city's website. So the most of the time, just we'll, we'll, we can pull an ordinance and see if we can find that. But most of the time, um, as Amy may attest, when we do this research, the whereas clauses and things like that don't give us the meat and, no. and bones of what they're doing. So the really the best guidance we would have is probably the LDRs themselves and what they say the board can and can't do. But we'll, well, I'll, I'll find the ordinance and see if there's anything that gives more direction than what was adopted through the ordinance. But if it's not specifically precluded, you know, let's try to work something out that enables us because like, uh, well, the code, the code does have language. If I'm correct, Amy, it says anything, our code is, what's the word not prohibitive or restrictive it's in essence if it's not if it's not specifically permitted in the code it is specifically excluded mm -hmm. so if it's silent that is a a prohibition by silence um in the code so our our code has language that says it's interpreted that that what is specifically allowed is allowed anything else is Ex off limits that's yeah. what i was wondering you know others other governmental en entities but if it's not specifically excluded, it's permitted. <laughs> yep. so. I, would, I would think we could also individually, not speaking for the board itself, and you know, email the commission and say, as a member of the Planning and Zoning Board, speaking on behalf of myself. I feel yeah, like. I mean, we can could, always do that. Yeah. But I guess I'm just, we've had several instances, and Ms. Clark detailed them pretty thoroughly, uh, in just the last few years where we've seen a, a real failure of our tree preservation policies. In contravention, I might add, to the specific goals in our comprehensive plan, which you know is a planning function. Yeah. So I'm just um, I'm thinking that you know if we could, in our advisory capacity, just say we would love it if you guys would take no, another I look. That, <laughs> I think that all of us no. um, know the elected officials to one extent or another in this city, and I think there is a benefit to your P and Z body speaking especially if we were to speak unanimously on an issue. No. I think that's something that um, the commission would certainly take notice of then. But um, yeah, if we could revisit this subject and you can email us all something in the interim, that'd be great, Mr. Bennett. Okay. I, I do have a couple more things. Just ahead, once a housekeeping detail, just a question. Um, are we able to meet um, by, by, by Zoom essentially uh, if we're not here? I know previously, prior to COVID, we weren't as an advisory board. The commission could, but we couldn't. Has so there's um, actually an advisory opinion um, that the Attorney General's Office for the state of Florida has interpreted the statutes to mean that you have to have a physical quorum. Um, once you establish a physical quorum, the use of communication technology for the, the additional members that are not present is not as clear. Um, in limited emergency situations, I believe the commission has used something like Skype on the pre-COVID. Right. Um, it's not something that we've ever considered or permitted to be extended to the boards. Um, so I, at this time, I, I don't think that it's something that the city would utilize. Um, but it's be here or, or unfortunately just can't participate. Okay. Um, I, I just have one other item. <laughs> in looking over the comprehensive plan this morning and having a discussion with Ms. Alvarez, we, um, I was looking at the neighborhood plans and our timetable for updating the, those, those plans, those master plans. And there's a number of them that are in the comp plan. Some, as we know, have been updated recently or created recently, like West Atlantic updated Southwest and Osceola has one now. But there are a number of them that were, for example, the neighborhood plan for Main Street in the Grove was updated in 1998. And we have an item in the comp plan saying we're gonna continue to support it, and but yet there's no real update there. A couple of the others, the downtown Delray master plan was adopted in 2002. We do have 
an item on there saying that it'll be updated in 2025 to 2040. Seacrest Del Ida neighborhood, which is NDC 2.7.23, adopted in 1998, on and on. Um, anyway, there's, there's several of them here. It just made me wonder if, uh, you know, we might want to do, if we as a body would ever want to kind of help this process and maybe um, have some neighborhood meetings where we try to update quality of life discussions uh, for that neighborhood and see what they're interested in. It might help the staff move this along a little bit as far as the updates. And, you know, we didn't necessarily have, a, have to have a quorum. Uh, you know, we could just go out to the neighborhood. We could have them at churches. You know, we could just see if there's an appetite by the citizens to come and talk about what they'd like to see for quality of life improvements in their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that sounded like a lot of work. Well, and that's, I used to call them charrettes in I'm, the old days. I'm sure staff will take a look at that possibility. I don't, I think that's probably outside the scope of this particular board. Um, but if that's something that, that staff reviews and can present to the commissioners on a one on one or, or in a meeting potentially, you know, I think that would really come from the commissioners. And then those meetings I don't envision would be the board meeting with the public. It'd be we have public right. outcry meetings or public, you know, meetings on items that can impact them. It'd be something similar I would guess. Right. It would, would be guess. similar to what we went through when we were um, looking at the Osceola plan update, uh -huh. something like that. And so those are all listed in the comp plan and um, if the city commission deems that one maybe is more ne more not necessary more important than the other at this or time urgent, yeah. then you know they can um, direct staff to say hey why don't we look at this and then we have to figure out how are we going to fund it <laughs> and then kind of go from right, there right. Uh, you know we, everything in that plan we want to do it that's the fun stuff <laughs> to a, to a limited, we need the money <laughs> and the time <laughs> to a limited extent when we do that infrastructure review mm -hmm. Um, we're gathering information from the various neighborhoods that come in and say, hey, I want my street paved or, you know, I want more lighting. Whatever we did the last, you know, this last review, it's along those same lines. So mm -hmm. I think that if it can be accomplished in some way, making more work for us, uh, I have one other item can I raise real quickly because I didn't finish on my list. Quickly. I don't mean to cut you. <laughs> I'm looking at the clock here. <laughs> take, take two minutes because we're not going to go, go anywhere. But I think we need to review this road closure ordinance because the, construction. the um, I don't understand how get the road closed all the time now for two weeks. I don't know whether they, ha they have to pay anything to the city for closing the road. I, th I would hope that the days of closing half of the street uh, like they did in Pineapple Grove for that hotel, half of two streets for two years, and as that Atlantic Crossing project still does, um, that they have to figure out a way to build their building by staying on their property to build the building. They can, I, I acknowledge that they have to cut the road to connect to, to the infrastructure or whatever, but to close Federal Highway for two weeks, I don't know how many more times they're gonna close Federal Highway. Look like the work they could have, that they're doing could have been done from the interior of their site. So that's my Pet Didn't commission on. take that up? Didn't commission take that up very recently? They did. Yeah, we actually we amended we the yeah, LDRs. Yeah. January. A year ago. Yeah. 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 I they, think that that hotel was already in. They get two weeks. Yeah. And then the meter starts ticking. That's an enforcement issue. Yeah. Uh, by ordinance, which we did deal with mm -hmm. at one of our meetings. Um, I'd be curious, along with Mr. Zeller, I'm sure, to find out if that actually uh, has been enforced on some of the projects. Um, particularly, I mean, Atlanta Crossing has its own individual problems, uh, but, and it's a I guess it's a little bitter in the summer, but during the season when that, 
goes down to one lane and the bridge is open, I mean, it's completely impassable. Um, PHG with their closing in federal into one lane. And closing, right? yeah. Closing federal. It, it's, yeah. it's tough. I mean, last, it, like in New York they City, they just they laugh closed, <laughs> They closed federal. Yeah. They just week, laugh at A couple right. of days <laughs> from Atlantic <laughs> what? to First Street. Crazy. Just close it this down because they needed a crane or something. That's <laughs> nuts. <laughs> right. <laughs> I just have one comment, very, very Please. quick comment. Okay, I'm done. Thank you for listening to my uh, Yes. Um, in plans. terms of streamlining and making your life, your development services lives easier, um, and I know the commission because we had the budget issue, but the digital permitting, um, um, are you guys still looking maybe for the next budget to bring that back up to commission? Oh yeah. mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, that's definitely. Okay. I was going to say, that's going to help you we so gotta much. we got to get there. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Great. We're adjourned. We're adjourned. <laughs> what up, where? Behind the camera. Uh, say, yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Thank you all for a good night. Have meeting. a good night, everybody. I'll see you on July 19th. Amy. Joy, how you been? Amy. 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 Amy.